I'd like to uh, call the meeting to order, if I can, please. I want to thank everybody uh, for coming. This is the um, first part of the uh, 2019 city budget. It's an opportunity we're going to be able to have uh, presentations, questions from all the agencies and divisions all across the city. Um, today and Wednesday we are set aside for that. There is a calendar in, that I believe has been sent out to everybody that will outline that and I'll of course go over that with you as we go through the process. Um, wanted to let everybody know you can find all the presentations online um, and there is hard copies at the back of the room for anybody who needs hard copies on any of the presentations. As you will see as we're going through the process, uh, there will be some groups uh, that will be presenting, others that won't. Um, in years past, we have had three or four days to go through the presentations. Today, or this year, because it's a, a, a election year, it's been compacted to, into two days. So we've had to make some decisions on who presents, who doesn't present. But I'm, and these conversations took place with the city manager, of course. I'm hoping that we'll have a full opportunity to ask the questions that everybody needs. So today we're going to be hearing from the Parking Tag or Toronto Police Services, Toronto Police Services Board, Parking Tag Enforcement Operations. We're also going to be hearing from presentations from the Community and Social Services Group and the Infrastructure and Development Group. So I'm going to call this meeting to order. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is on the traditional territory of the many nations including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anish Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the New Credit. As I said, this is a special meeting of the Budget Committee uh, where we're reviewing the 2019 Capital Operating and Rate Budgets. Are there any declarations of interest? Seeing none. Anyway, so what we'll do is... Um, Oh, okay. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. I'd like to, I, I need to declare a conflict of interest on the water budget, specifically the portion as it pertains to the fee for service that's received by an organization for our blue flag program. Okay. This is, uh, as my wife works for that organization. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Again, as I was saying, there is um, uh, an a list on all the presentations that will be happening, so make sure you have that and, and I will run down that with you. After we have the presentations today, of course, we're going to reconvene on Wednesday to continue hearing uh, more presentations and, of course, questions. I want to remind members um, that if you have any motions or briefing note requests, um, as we go through the process, you'll be hearing and asking questions if you need more information. Uh, on any particular issue and you may want to move a motion for a briefing note request. That is a request for information that you would probably want to have come forward based on questions. Um, the way we have done it in the past, number one, it, make sure that the requests get into the clerk as soon as possible um, and the clerk and will we'll forward them to me with your uh, agreement. What I want to do is bring all these briefing note requests in. Uh, we'll review them. Sometimes it may be that a question or a briefing note could be asked or answered by a staff member and you may not necessarily need a form of briefing note or we could have a quick conversation. So it's always important that we, we review all of them. We'll be moving all these briefing note requests on Wednesday at the final day of the presentations. Um, that'll give staff enough time to bring all the briefing note requests together, get them done and get them to us by the, uh, as we get into the final wrap-ups. But if you can make sure that you do get those requests, I've received a couple of them already, So, I, but it'd be really important to make sure you get them into the clerk as soon as possible and not leave it to the end. Are there any questions on the process before we get going? Yes, just on a point of order. Um, this has to do with if we intend to move something that impacts a rate-supported budget, the rate, in past years we've moved them at an earlier point just to have it on record that there's an intent to adjust the rate. Can the clerk remind us of when we should be putting those forward? Specifically, the industrial water surcharge rate I would like to um, have changed. So very good. So, Council, I understand. So this year, we of course, normally the rate based is separate. We've actually included it just because of a yeah. timing issue. Um, I think the clerk can correct me, but I would 
probably at the end of presentations tomorrow. Move that mo yeah, I, I would entertain. So not only briefing note requests, but uh, again, I know the motion you're going to be moving. I would, you know, you could move that. Um, at the end of day Wednesday? Yeah, at Perfect. the end of Wednesday. Thank you. I believe clerks already have the motion, uh, so, and, but I put the date on incorrectly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions process-wide? Why don't we begin? Um, we'll be having a presentation um, from the Toronto Police Service. So why don't we invite them to come up? So we'll be doing a presentation from the Toronto Police Service, the Toronto Police Services Board, and the Parking Tag Enforcement and Operations. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you the board-approved 2019 budget request for the Toronto Police Service, the uh, Services Parking Enforcement Unit, and the Toronto Police Services Board. Uh, I'm the chair of the board, uh, Andy Pringle, and with me today are the Chief of Police, Mark Saunders, the Chief Administrative Officer, Tony Veneziano, and Ms. Savina Dollywall, who is the Director of Finance and Business Management. The budgets we're presenting have been developed in a dynamic period where we continue to be focused on transformation and organizational change. And I'd like to begin by providing uh, some information about the legislative context in which we operate. As you know, Section 29 of the Police Service Act requires that the board shall submit operating and capital estimates to the Municipal Council that show the amounts needed to maintain the police service and to pay the board's operating expenses. Um, as you know, in January 2017, uh, the Joint Board and Service Transformational Task Force released its final report entitled The Action Plan, The Way Forward, with 32 recommendations focused on modernization and transformation. It provided a variety of opportunities for sustained savings and presented a modern version of policing in this city. It outlined a plan to modernize the Toronto Police Service with the approach uh, that we cannot meet new and growing policing needs with an old policing model, and with the vision of a modern, effective police service that makes the best use of existing resources while leveraging technology, information, and community partnerships. I'm pleased to say that we uh, today are on track to achieve the changes recommended in the way forward. Uh, we, determined, uh, we are determined to succeed in providing trusted and effective service when and where the public needs us, responding to the complex needs of our city and, and its communities. The Way Forward also serves as a business plan for the Toronto Police Service for 2017 through 2019. The board worked closely with the service and the city uh, programs to facilitate aspects of this report. The Way Forward is still very much a work in process in its uh, progress in its implementation, with challenges uh, remaining to be met and issues to be resolved but the board is determined that this will continue to be both a priority and a guiding force going forward as we maintain our pursuit of excellence in policing. At its meeting on the 24th of January 2019, the board approved the Toronto Police Service's 2019 net operating budget request of $1,026,800,000, uh, which represents a 3% increase over the 2018 approved budget. The budget request includes the hiring of over 300 uniformed officers, 122 special constables, 186 part-time retirees, and over 200 other civilian positions. I'm pleased that for the last two years in a row, the services held the operating budget at a net zero percent increase. The service and the city will continue to benefit from the savings and efficiencies gained since 2015. The board believes this budget request continues the service's commitment to fis fiscal discipline and accountability while ensuring the service is resourced with people, technology, analytics, and professional capabilities to enable our modernization journey while still delivering adequate and effective policing. I believe the budgets that we present to you today for your approval 
uh, clearly demonstrate that the board and the service are very much uh, aware and cognizant of the significant fiscal constraints the City of Toronto is facing. At the same time, it is incumbent upon the board to establish a budget that ensures that the city has provided policing services that are not only adequate and effective, but also progressive and evolving. I believe that the budget we're presenting to you accomplishes these significant objectives. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Chief Mark Saunders, who will lead the discussion on the services budget request. And following this, uh, I will provide an overview of the board's budget, and after the presentation, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I won't take uh, a lot of the time. The uh, deck that will be presented will be presented by the CEO as well as the director, but uh, just a, a quick overview of uh, responsibilities, Chief, is for the adequate and effective delivery of services uh, to enhance the community safety under the five pillars under the Police Services Act. When we talk about the modernization plan and what we're trying to deliver, it's how we deliver those services in order to have uh, a model that is nimble and sustainable in today's environment. So looking at the playbook and things that we we have to do to make those necessary changes in today's environment. I'll talk upon three aspects with respect to the budget and why it's necessary for us to move forward with this request. First and foremost, we've done everything that we can when it comes to delivering that service. When we talk about people, changing the way in which we provide the proper resources from the people perspective, whereas before it was full-time police officers going to all of these calls, utilizing special constables have played a tremendous role. We've piloted it. It's successful. It works. They are helping with relieving frontline pressures so that my folks with gun belts on have the ability of going to those priority one and priority two calls. When we talk about the new uh, um, model that we're bringing in with the part-time retirees, that is necessary for us to have the ability of scaling up our capacity and reducing our capacity. The pressures that we have right now are in twofold. Number one, the hiring has just started, but number two, this is a gap in time where we were hiring in high numbers, which means at this present time, people are leaving in large numbers as well too. So having the ability of filling that gap with part-time is something that's necessary for us to move in place. When we talk about our alternate delivery processes, we have changed the way in which we've been doing business to be still delivering the necessary uh, requirements on, under law and also providing the same quality, but changing the playbook and how we deliver. So for example, when we talk about the theft of gas, theft of liquor, when we talk about our shoplifter pilot projects, these are all mechanisms where the delivery method has changed, but we're still giving the same quality of policing that we are providing. And when we talk about technology, technology is a critical leverage point for us if we're going to be able to modernize our agency. And when we talk about our connected officers and the opportunity to expand on that, the productivity that we're getting when we untether our frontline people from cars and into communities has been a fantastic tool. The expansion of that, as well as looking at Q4, having the body one cameras being implemented for uh, our frontline officers. When we look at all of those factors and we talk about uh, the two critical things that we need right now, the frontline pressures are very high. Our calls for service have gone up. Uh, you've read the papers. You have an understanding of what the issues are when it comes to crime and disorder in the city. And at the same time, the second aspect, which is of critical importance to me, is a gun violence reduction plan, utilizing those tools that are necessary to keep the community safe, utilizing new methodology, leveraging technology, and being streamlined, focused, intelligence led policing so that we're not disrupting communities but actually apprehending those that are the ones that are shooting other people. Uh, having said that, I'll turn it over to the CEO, CAO as well as my director to go through the deck with you and I'll be uh, available for questions after. Thank you, Chief. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Um, so our, uh, uh, if, if you can just go to the slide. As the chair mentioned, uh, we went through a transformation a couple of years ago and we're still in, in the process of modernizing what we do. And essentially our, our 2019 budget is guided by the way forward report that basically emanated out of that transformation effort. The chair mentioned that we've come in at 0% for 2017 and 2018. We've saved over $100 million since 2015. The bulk of that came from a higher moratorium. We also returned a couple of facilities to the city that you can now use to, uh, for other operations. You can monetize, develop. But that, that uh, uh, strategy continues. We're looking for areas where we streamline operations, where we consolidate operations so that, in fact, if there's opportunities to return assets to the city, we will. And we've already got two or three that we've identified 
that we basically think can be returned to the city and that the city can use for other purposes. So that effort is continuing. If you look at these two graphs, it shows uh, two things. Number one, that we've basically come out under the rate of the, 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 the graph on, the, on the, the left, that we've come under this, the, uh, the, the CPI almost every year since 2012, with the exception of two years. And the, and the graph on the left shows that if you take out the COLA increase, which is really beyond our control, but one still have to pay, it shows that if we hadn't had COLA, our budget has actually decreased. And what that tells you is that we've actually absorbed both COLA and other inflationary pressures in the last few years, and that's shown in the request that we've put forward. So in 2018, we made over 27,000 arrests. We had over 2 million calls for service. We seized over 100 or 1,000 uh, firearms. We attended over 600,000 calls, and we, we cleared about half of the major crimes that we uh, investigated. Overall, our pressures continue to increase. The city is growing. Uh, tourism, we continue to be the leading tourist destination in Canada, close to four, 44 million visitors. We're bound by legislation, cannabis being a recent example, and our calls for service continue to increase. The other thing that's changed is the landscape or, or the nature of crime. We're now dealing with cyber crime, increased homicides, uh, na um, events of national security, guns and gangs. All of these force us to do business in a different way and force us to now recognize that Crime as it existed, uh, let's say 10 years ago, has changed dramatically and therefore requires a different approach. And all of this is happening, and as the Chair mentioned, we continue to be part and, and continuing in our modernizing uh, journey where we're looking at various uh, things where we can civilianize, where we look at our people, and our people being the greatest asset that we have. We've, we've created a, a Deputy Chief of, of Human Resources whose main focus now is to make sure that the people have the competencies, the talents, and, and the tools to make sure that they can do their jobs uh, effectively. The Chief mentioned the Connected Officer expansion uh, as another way of making our workforce more mobile. Staffing has decreased. We've gone down 490 uniform officers since 2015. Our civilian strength has decreased by 126. Our overall vacancy rate is 12% plus. And we're expecting to lose another 250 officers and 100 civilians in, 2000 and, uh, or in 2019. And these reduced staffing levels, these increasing calls for service, an active modernization agenda are all placing a strain on operations and, and staff and therefore require the investment that we are requesting in our 2019 uh, request. And so our budget aims to provide sufficient resources to keep the lights on and to keep ongoing services going, but also to maintain public safety and continue our transformation objective. The Chief talked about the district uh, special constables and the retired officers. We're also looking at work that police officers currently perform, like crime analysis, and basically what we're saying, we don't need a police officer to do that. We can actually hire civilians who are better trained, who have the knowledge, and at a lower rate. And so we're now civilianizing 28 crime analyst positions across the service and putting civilians in those positions and then returning those officers to front line where they should be providing public safety services and that's why we hired them. We're moving, continuing to move from a divisional to a district model of policing and there's consolidations and, and that's not a physical move, although some may. It's not blending facilities. It's really looking at the way that we provide services and streamlining them, consolidating, doing those services better, and hopefully return greater assets to the front line. At this last meeting of, of the uh, 2018, Council adopted a number of different strategies and motions. Three of them dealt with the CCTV, Shot Spotter, and Neighborhood Officer Program. There are no monies in our 2019 budget for those three programs. Those were premised on the fact that we would ask other levels of government to uh, perhaps provide funding for those. We did, we did ask the federal government through the National Crime Prevention Grants for uh, uh, CCTV, Shot Spotter, and the Neighborhood Officer Program. That request has been denied. Uh, our grants were not successful, so we have no funds in our budget for that. With respect to gun violence, the province did give us uh, 19 million out of 25 million that they announced over a four-year period. So we basically get $4.9 million for the next four years uh, to help us combat gun and gang violence uh, across the city. The other thing that City Council asked is to look at the summer safety program, which we, we spent $2.7 million on in 2018, and see if we should uh, continue that program into 2019. 
We have no money in our budget for that program. We, the chief has still not decided whether in fact that is even required. And so we'll be looking at that as the summer approaches and we see how crime is pro progressing. Council also requested that we hire 100 new officers uh, immediately, uh, funded through the 2018 tax rate, uh, with the other costs to, to be part of our 19 budget. And so in 2018, in the December class, we actually hired 134 recruits, and the ongoing costs of these recruits are incorporated into our 219 uh, request. And so those are the council motions. Uh, some key performance indicators. The calls for service, both emergency and non-emergency. Emergency calls are actually going up about 10%. Um, as I mentioned before, the nature and landscape of crime is basically changing. We're also dealing with different legislation in terms of that are more resource intensive. These are legislative requirements that uh, speak to evidentiary standards and processes. And all those things are contributing to the fact that we are now, our officers are spending more on each call for service than they did, let's say, in 2015. And you see in that graph that it's quite uh, an increase from 15 to 2018 in terms of what they spend time on. Seven major crime indicators are usually a barometer of how we measure safety in a city in terms of where people want to live, work, play, and be entertained. And so our crime rates have actually trended downwards from 2008 to 2018, but in the last three years they've actually started going up. And so you'll see that from 2016 to 17 they were up 5%, and they are up another 3% in 2018. The biggest change, as you can see, that is uh, homicide, which has our homicide rates, which have basically gone up almost 50%. Um, and if you, you look at shooting incidents, they've gone up from 392 uh, to 426, a 9% change since 2017. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our Director of Finance and Business Management, Savina Daliwal, who will take us through some of the details in our budget request. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly go through this slide, uh, essentially in terms of how the police funding model and how we're funded, um, primarily through property tax, but there is a portion that we receive from other levels of government, so provincial, uh, federal and whatnot. Um, there's a portion that are user fees, so things like pay duties, record checks, and then we have our reserves and we have interdepartmental uh, uh, recoveries. Where the money goes, 87% of our budget is related to people. We are a people business, salaries, benefits, premium pay. Um, in terms of non-salary, we purchase roughly $100 million in uh, goods and services on any given year. Uh, so our recommended um, operating budget, it's a 3% increase over um, 2018. Um, that follows, uh, as was mentioned, um, two years in a row of uh, 0%. And that represents roughly $30 million from 2018 to 19. What this buys us is an average deployed um, uniform presence of 4730, additional support to priority response in the form of the civilianization of positions and, and programs like the special constables, um, and, and the hiring um, between the sworn and civilian ranks of over 800 positions to partially offset um, the, the significant uh, rate of um, separations that we're currently facing, court security of over 270 uh, provincial courtrooms, the continuation of an enhanced neighborhood officer pilot, um, increasing capabilities to support our modernization agenda as well as to combat uh, gangs and gun criminals as well as um, you know, continuing um, to keep the lights on as the CAO had mentioned. In terms of how the overall increase is divided, um, these are our main categories, so salaries, uh, premium pay, the statutory deductions and benefits, contributions to reserves, and then all the other non-salary. I'll go through each one of these categories at a high level to explain the different changes. So salaries, the, what, salaries is really premised on um, in 2018, we lost over 400 uh, members on the uniform and civilian side. We continue um, to expect that that rate of separation will continue into 2019, so we are anticipating at least another 250 uniform and 100 civilians to be separated. In addition, we currently have a vacancy rate of 12% um, that was built up over the years. 
So some of the salary um, requirement is to start to hire back up to more sustainable levels. But what is also built into our um, hiring assumption is, is $13 million of gapping, which is just being able to stagger the timing of all of these hires that we intend to do. Um, in, at a high level, um, what, what's included are board approved impacts that were approved last year in terms of our communication operator positions. This is 911 to better meet um, regulatory standards as well as a continuation of some of our HR transformation positions. Civilianization um, was mentioned a few times um, and, it, and it's important to understand that concept because it's a key part of changing the way we do our work and changing our service delivery model. So we are taking a look at all the roles in the service and really looking at where do you need um, an officer with the officer authorities, the gun to do that work and where do you, where can you supplement that with um, a civilian, typically at a lower cost, but with the skills to still perform that work without compromising public safety. So there's a number of civilianization efforts that are underway and additional supports with the goal of increasing the priority response capacity and focusing our uniform efforts on where they're most needed. In addition, um, as I mentioned, our, our vacancy rate is 12% service-wide, but it's actually 40% just on the 14% just on the civilian side. So there's critical vacancies that we now need to look at filling after a few years of a hiring moratorium and new programs that were introduced to the board and approved um, in terms of our corporate communication capabilities and um, a, the part-time retiree uh, program, which is intended to provide in a supplemental support to the front line. So what all of this hiring translates to is a gradual shift in our service delivery model. Um, in 2019, and this is predicated based on how many people we think we're gonna, that will separate, how many people we recruit, but the plan is to hire about 320 uniform um, police officers and roughly 184 positions that support our civilianization efforts. Because of how we are staggering the hiring, they, they are not all hired January 1st, those 184 positions really translate to 90 full-time equivalents in 2019 that will be added to that frontline capacity. Um, so that overall, you have 4730 average uniform deployed, which is down significantly over the years as the graph shows, supplemented by 90 civilianized full-time equivalents that will then fully annualize to 184 next year. But this is the gradual shift and balance between uniform hiring as well as a civilianization to provide additional frontline support. Premium pay. So premium pay has been um, an underfunded, under budgeted account for years. Um, last this year alone, so the 2018 closing, we are projecting to be over 20 million above our original premium pay budget. So we took a look at what's causing the premium pay over the last number of years, and there's a direct correlation between premium pay and our staffing levels. We backed out extraordinary events to say, what is the minimum premium pay requirement without programs like summer safety, without extraordinary events we hope to never repeat, like the Downforth or, or um, Young and Finch. And that is what is driving the $8.5 million increase. We still believe that that is um, the minimum required, that this is an account that will continue to face pressure because it's subject to police exigencies, but this is this year our attempt to try and recalibrate to a more reasonable number than it has been in the past few years. Um, the next bucket uh, is, is statutory deductions and benefits, and they're just that, they're statutory. Um, we, we, we took a look at what we're spending and where. There is an increasing rising cost on um, our post-retirement benefits and our medical and dental coverage, but what you'll see is 40% of this is OMERS. Um, 
And then the balance of it, we, we recalibrated a bit, so we've reduced where we could. But overall, this is a category that is increasing in terms of healthcare costs and our um, benefits. Um, but the, the net impact for 2019 is, is um, essentially 0% year over year. Contribution to reserves. So we have a number of reserves for that, that are set up to essentially smooth out the cost um, where for those cost categories that are subject to a lot of fluctuation. Um, vehicle and equipment reserve makes up the largest part of this increase. As we modernize, as we move to, from cars to SUVs, replace the life cycle of that equipment is more costly. We are looking at what the health of that reserve is, what our future requirements are, and we predict future years are in a deficit position, so this is the year we need to be able to put a little bit more in to accommodate um, our future costs. Other expenditures represent all of the other non-salary, so rent, contracted services, you know, some of the training, legal expenses, overall, um, computer maintenance, overall, um, if you, the 16.8 of that, four of it is actually offset by reserves, by our modernization reserve, um, and that's really to support the way forward in our modernization um, initiatives. And then the other ones, there, there's a mix, you know, there's computer maintenance, these are contractual costs that had economic increases built in. Um, operating impacts from capital, so as a project, completes from our capital program, we now need to maintain it. So it reflects costs as an example for our connected officer program. It's the mobility plans so that we can continue with that program. And then recruiting. Recruiting, um, there, there are one-time costs that are significant um, related to the recruiting that we're doing. Reven revenues, um, so as I mentioned, in addition to property tax, there are other revenues that the service receives. Um, but just a, a point of clarification, all of these revenues have other expenditures that offset it. Um, we're, not, we're not for profit. Uh, so recoveries, we've adjusted the interdepartmental recoveries to reflect the transfer of the Crossing Guard program. We are assuming uh, similar provincial grant levels to what we received in 2018. So the big ones, the notable ones, the Court Security Prisoner trans trans Transportation. Um, guns and Gang Grant, as well as PEM. Uh, user fees, there's a minor uh, uh, change just related to how we respond to uh, alarms, uh, residential and commercial uh, alarms. And reserve fundings, this is really the draw to offset expenditures that we have um, related to our modernization. So Mr. Chair, um, the slide shows our, our ask. It's uh, 1.17 billion dollar on a gross basis, 1.026 billion on a net basis. It's a 30.3 million increase over 2018. But I want to just talk about very quickly some of the challenges that, uh, uh, that and risks that we face. Um, currently not included in this budget is the neighborhood officer uh, program expansion. Uh, right now we have neighborhood officers in 33 neighborhoods across the city. We'd like to expand that to uh, 60. Um, but that takes additional funds to do it, which we currently don't have. So certainly that's uh, an area that we, would, uh, we will continue to pursue with the city and hopefully other levels of government. Uh, we're not really sure on the impact of the cannabis legislation. It only came into effect in, in October. So we do have some uh, very little funds. We've got about $400,000 in our budget uh, for that, which is offset. We're assuming that we're going to get uh, uh, funded for that. So it's a 0% impact. I mentioned before, CCTV expansion is not included. And then some of the risks is on premium pay, you say, well, it's on up eight and a half million. That should be enough. The, the reality is that we're going to be watching that account very closely because we are still, uh, our, our staffing level is still not where we'd like it to be, both civilian and uniform. So certainly that may be an effect, but we'll be monitoring that very closely. The budget also assumes that we're going to get court security and PEM funding from the province. We have not heard to the contrary. So we are assuming that that is something that we'll be getting. And you can see it's a 40 million and $10 million bill, respectively. And as Savina mentioned, we are, we, in order to um, uh, acknowledge the fiscal realities that the city is facing, we wanted to make sure that we balanced our need with the, 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 uh, the realities and the challenges that the city's facing. And so 
We were very aggressive with our, with our gapping in order to achieve the 3% increase. That may come back and, and require a, a revisit because we don't know which people are going to be leaving and if, if it's the positions that we require that could put some pressure on our budget and so we'll be monitoring that closely as well. And that's our operating budget, uh, Mr. Chair. If you'd like us to continue with capital, we will, or we can stop here and take any questions. Yeah, we can uh, probably make sense just to continue, and we'll do all the questions after, yep. if that's okay with members. Okay, um, so we'll get we'll dive right into the capital, um, our capital program. So this the the capital program is really um, reflective of some of the major projects and milestones that we've achieved in 2018 and, and builds on, on new projects and continues others. So we just completed a peer-to-peer -peer site, which is really our disaster recovery plan. Um, we've started the initial phases of the body-worn camera. Um, so we, we just finished the RFI piece of it, and, you'll, and we'll talk a bit about what's included in 2019 related to that. Um, we deployed 700 devices in support of our Connected Officer program in 2018. We completed the parking handheld program in, in uh, uh, related to, um, partly related with the city. Um, we continue to transform our corporate support, which is really around HR transformation and um, making best use of our resources and the tools that allow us to do that. Um, and then various other kind of life cycle replacements and state of goods repair. Overall, the capital, um, program reflects uh, a few objectives. One, um, enable, uh, enable a technology and intelligence-based policing model. So there are projects that are um, related to technology, related to BI. Um, it, it is also where we upgrade all of our vehicle and equipment. Um, so any major system um, upgrades happen through a capital program. Enable officer mobility, so that speaks really to the connected officer program as well as realign and optimize our infrastructure in support of a district policing model. Overall, um, we are meeting the city's debt target on average in the first five years and in the second five years. So over the 10 year program, we are meeting the target. There is um, fluctuations year over year related to cash flow, especially um, when it comes to our facilities programs. We review and adjust this annually to make sure we're staying within our targets. And we use a prioritized stage gating approach, which is also best practice with the city in terms of what goes into the capital program and, and how far does, does it take us. So overall, um, next slide. so overall, um, what this essentially um, buys us over the 10 year cycle, but also specifically in 2019, um, it's going through the procurement process for body-worn camera, so just getting to the point of better understanding the cost and better understanding the solution. Um, maturing what is already deployed from a connected officer um, program, continuing our state of goods repair on our facilities, continuing progress on our district policing model um, and other life cycles, and continuing our HRMS and, and HR transformation initiatives. Specific projects, so in categories, there is a whole infrastructure component, an IT component, vehicles, uh, communications, and then and then the equipment side. Um, and then the, this really um, reflects the, the various categories, whether it's legislated, state of goods repair. So for us, state of goods repair um, has, has quite a bit of our capital program assigned to it, as well as certain legislative components and then service improvements. Those are our main three categories that our projects fall into. And then um, lastly, um, I, we wanted to quickly touch on what are the unfunded components that still require ongoing discussion in terms of how they will eventually either make their way in or how we will do that prioritization. So the body-worn camera piece of it, as I mentioned, 2019 covers the procurement part of it. We will have a better sense of what it costs at some point this year to then figure out how does that fit in to the 2020 onwards capital program. Um, expanding the connected officer program. So currently the program covers the 700 devices that we've deployed. Further expansion of that is still, we're, we're figuring out how to include that in. Um, global searches is a data and analytics program. 
CCTV expansion, as the CAO mentioned, we first went um, the federal grant route to get that funded. That hasn't happened, so we, we, it's just it's subject to future discussions on how we incorporate that. Um, NG911, there's a first phase of it that is included in our, in our program, and it's really the technical upgrade component. There's a future uh, phase that's legislated mandated that we need to work with city and the other sort of EMS counterparts on, on how this whole NG911 will actually take form. And then the balance of our facility realignment and district model, there's elements of it that are still um, in the planning and design phase that haven't fully made their way into the capital program and these are all subject to future budget cycles. Um, and that concludes our capital program. Um, Chair, would you like us to go parking. into parking as well? Yeah, we can do that quickly. Okay. So for so our parking program is really um, it's very much shared and joint with the city. Uh, we do the parking enforcement. Um, really, our focus is the safe and orderly flow of traffic, um, and and through that we have parking enforcement and parking tags. It's very much shared though with the city. So the items in gray are what the city does in terms of collecting the fine and managing the dispute resolution. Um, we really just do the enforcement piece. Uh, 2018 successes. So we have overall reduced court attendance, which was also results in reduced premium pay because of the new upgraded um, administrative penalty system program. We have an online uh, reporting tool now for immediate parking complaints, which is less manual as a result. We issued over 2 million parking tags um, and towed approximately 30,000 vehicles and um, addressed over 150,000 um, parking concerns. For our 2019 budget, it is flat year over year. Um, it does factor in maintaining existing level of staffing um, levels. So we factored in just attrition and separations. We do have a pilot currently underway that we're evaluating that actually moves some of our parking officers closer to the core, which is primarily where they enforce. And as a result of coming in flat, we are ongoing monitoring um, the inflationary pressures that we are inherently in, uh, build, built into our 0% increase. So overall, our budget is 0%. There's minor ups and downs. The big one is our premium pay we've seen reduced because we're not attending court as often. However, the maintenance of the new administrative uh, penalty system is up marginally, um, but overall the two offset. And that concludes parking. Uh, board, we'll do our final one. We'll talk through the board. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to take the opportunity to walk you uh, through the Toronto Police Service Board's 2019 net operating budget request of $2,458,300, which it was approved at the board uh, at its meeting on January the 24th, 2019. As you know, the under the Police Services Act, the board is tasked with a number of important responsibilities among them ensuring the provision of adequate and effective policing in Toronto, determining the priorities and objectives after consultation with the chief, uh, establishing policies for effective management of the service, appointing the chief uh, deputies and certain uh, senior executive members of the service, approving the budgets for transmission to the city, negotiating the collective agreements with the Toronto Police Association and the senior officers organization, and monitoring the performance of the chief of police and the deputy chiefs of police. The board is facing a number of significant current challenges uh, as the demand for adequate and effective policing increases due to population growth and the implementation of uh, transformation uh, as it continues. The board must uh, inc uh, address increasingly complex community concerns and governance issues. Among the key items of priority this year, the board uh, remains focused on how police officers can best respond to people who are dealing with mental health and addiction issues, as well as how to support employee health and wellness programs internally. In addition, we continue to build on our work in uh, uh, confronting issues of bias, including a critical examination of the board's policy on collection, 
use and reporting of demographic uh, statistics, which includes race-based data. In April 2018, the board uh, established a new anti-racism advisory panel, and this work will continue uh, through uh, 2019 and into the future. Uh, we're also poised to respond to anticipated changes as a result of the Safer Ontario Act and other new amended legis legislation relative to uh, policing and the board's work. In 2018, the board appointed a reviewer to conduct an independent review of the board's policies as well as the service procedures and practice in relation to missing person investigations. The review commenced in September 2018. In 2019, uh, this remains a priority as we enter the second year of our missing persons investigation review with a focus on policies and procedures governing missing persons investigations. The board also remains focused on significant policy issues and emerging matters, uh, most important among them cannabis, uh, changes in street checks regulation and community engagements and uh, community engagement and partnerships. The board office and its staff is critical to the board's ability to carry out its important governance function. The board staff members provide uh, policy research and strategic advice to the board and to the chair, ensuring that communications are shared widely through its website and social media and responding to an ever increasing number of inquiries from the public and organizations uh, and engaging with uh, key stakeholders on a variety of issues. As a result of new and growing challenges, the board's 2019 budget includes money for proposed improvements to the office. It includes funds for a new role for strategic audit and governance, which would analyze Toronto Police Service procedures in relation to board policies, enhance international best practices research, and monitor implementation of recommendations. Funding is also included to provide additional support for public inquiries and advisory panels and greater professionalization of the uh, board staff. So we're really talking about um, uh, three increases. One is a new full-time role for a senior advisor, uh, strategic audit and governance. The 2019 request would total $104,000. Uh, a new half-time uh, role for administrative assistant, the 2019 request would total $26,300. And then the recap classification of an existing administrative assistant role to an executive assistant uh, reporting to a director with the responsibility uh, uh, for more of the, uh, the, 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 the public uh, response and answering public questions, and the 2019 request for that would total 18,900. The total of uh, the total 2019 uh, cost increase is 149,200 for really the additional one and a half uh, positions plus the reclassification of the existing uh, position. Um, the board's total uh, proposed 2019 net operating budget is therefore uh, 2,458,300 over the 2018 adjusted budget of uh, 2,309,100. So that's the increase of the 149,200. And it should be noted that all other aspects of the board's operating budget would see a 0% uh, increase. So that uh, concludes, Mr. Chair, our presentations, and we would be happy to entertain any questions on any of the budgets. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to outside councillors to begin, and we'll start with Councillor Perks. Hi, good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so if I'm reading this correctly, you're asking for a 3% or 30 million increase on the operating budget over last year. Um, I note in the analyst notes it says that you've also entered collective bargaining, but the ask here doesn't include any money for that collective bargaining. It does not, you're correct. If I'm reading elsewhere correctly, uh, uniform salary is about 565 million a year, so a 1% increase on that would be 56 million, 57 million. In terms of an increase in the salaries? Just salary, not benefit or anything else, yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be, if we were to increase our salaries by that amount, yes. Okay. So what, what you need is actually 30 million plus, if it's 1%, 57, if it's 2%, 110, annualized. So let me clarify. Annualized. It is not, it, it, if you're talking about COLA, uh, is it the like cost of living increase that you're talking about? No, I'm talking about the collective bargaining you have right. with your uniforms.
what is the amount of money you spend annually on uniform salaries? So I thought on page 22 or 3 of your presentation, you gave a 560 some. So all of salary is $758 million. Yes, and three quarters of that's uniform, right? On yes. page 23 of your presentation. Right. Page 23 of your presentation. No, it's not 23. It's no. Oh, I got away. So, like, if one, if your salaries, if your salary for uniforms is 550 million a year. In round. So one percent is is, is five point six million. Five point six million. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Mm. Got to learn how to do math. It's <laughs> early. So one percent is five on top of the thirty. Two percent is ten on top of the thirty, and so on. And that's assuming no change to the premium pay, no change to the benefits. That's strictly because we have civilians also who are part of that collective agreement. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, in the. I heard you mention uh, as you were going through that you don't yet have in hand uh, an agreement with the provincial government on pr on court costs for the, the policing. Well, the agreement with the provincial government ended at the end of December of 18, and right. we just haven't heard anything yet. They haven't said that they're not funding it. They just right. haven't said that they okay. are funding it. And what's the what's the net cost this? On we get right now about 40, um, the pie across the province is 125 million, we get about 40 million of that. 40 million, and that's a full cost recovery? No, it's a subsidy, our, it's, our courts is probably worth about 66 million dollars, so it's about two thirds. So the city is still, even if you get the same agreement, the city would be subsidizing the provincial courts by about 26 million? Correct. Okay. Um, to, on the analyst notes, so maybe this is to, to finance staff. I'm looking on pages 15 and 16. Um, I note that uh, unlike any other department I've looked at, uh, the 10-year capital plan here actually eliminates the capital, the state of good repair backlog for the Toronto Police Service. Is that correct? Pages 15 and 16 of the analyst notes for the police service. Given that the uh, three, Mr. Chair, given that this is quite limited just to the vehicle and, and um, the vehicle and fleet replacement, that's what really this is reflecting. In terms of their buildings, that's focused under the facilities management program. So police facilities are in the police facility station. real real estate. Yeah. yeah. So, but nevertheless, in terms of the vehicles and so on, this complete over the ten course of the ten year, we go from uh, nine and a half percent backlog as a percentage of asset value to zero. Assuming there's no increase in new fleet and new equipment. Yes. Assuming that, um, and I, I haven't read every single analyst. But this is the only one where I've seen that happen. There are a few, but not many. Okay, we'll have to find those. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Councillor. Any other outside questions? We'll go into committee. Uh, Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, one thing, and I think I may have figured out the answer, but the inter interdivisional recoveries, they were down by three million, but is that to offset the, the crossing guard? Okay, because I saw the crossing guard item come in as a revenue, s as, as a reduction in the service level, but no cost associated with it. But that's the that's interdivisional correct. coverage. It's, it's basically a wash then. Okay, it's basically a wash. Okay. Um, the, uh, the repurposing of the special constables, there's 184 positions, um, it's civilianized positions, and then there's a line under there that says repurposing of the special constables. Can you just explain what that means? Where, where is that? Let me, uh, I'll, I'll find that quickly now, but 
It's on page, I think page 10 of the analyst notes. Repurposing 96 uniform positions for special constables. Okay, so if you could clarify that, I don't have analyst notes, so I'm sorry. Okay. So you, what, what is the question, sir, with respect to? I'm just curious what that means, repurposing 96 uniform positions to? Yeah, so special. when we talk about putting the right resource in the right place at the right time, this is what speaks to that. So the special constable program are um, officers, well, we've got a lot of special constables, but this, the special constables that are going to the districts, they will assist the frontline officers. So they are in uniform, they do not have the gun belt. Their training is different, but it is still intense training. Their programs last 12 weeks. Uh, frontline police constable, uh, officers with a gun belt, with the vests that have to have the use of force training three days every single year, um, compared to special constables who do not. Um, these special constables have the opportunity for doing different things, such as crime scene protection, uh, such as um, going to uh, various uh, uh, calls where normally police officers would be going to. So if you take a, a, a homicide scene and it's seven days, for example, that would be two officers, 24 hours a day, um, until that scene is cleared. Now we put special constables in, which frees up the frontline officers to go out and do those other priority calls. And, and to have a constable uh, from start day one hiring to get them on the road, you're talking six to seven months. So they're faster to put in. Um, they are directly related to relieving the frontline pressures and assisting the frontline people. And through our pilot project, we found tremendous success, especially in those areas and those divisions of the districts that have uh, a lot more capacity than other divisions. And so we're expanding the program. We're expanding uh, how to utilize the special constables to the best of our ability in the district uh, model. And we're seeing uh, great success stories behind that. Okay, I have two more, two more quick questions. One. Um on the sick pay gratuities and health care spending pressure, there's a, there's a funding, a revenue change for funding for sick pay gratuity and health care spending account reserves. Is that not going to put us at risk if we're spending money from those reserves? We actually added a uh, million uh, dollars more incremental to better uh, represent what we're going to be taking out of that reserve as our okay. members leave. Okay. So we've actually increased it by a million. Um, and then finally, um, on the, you, you described the civilian gapping as aggressive. Could you explain how, how someone, how any resident might experience the service level change as a result of your aggressive gapping? So the aggressive gapping will not be on services that are, the public would see. So 911 operators, court services, those types of things that uh, our pe people see every day really won't be impacted. But it will impact the support that we provide to our frontline officers. And our, our goal is to try to minimize that impact by prioritizing uh, where we hire and really looking at what the impact is going to be and you know, prioritize that ahead of one that perhaps can wait. So it's really may, may basically deferring the hiring a little bit longer so that we can save some money and better meet the 3% the increase. Then, then what's the fear? You put it under a, like a potential challenge. The What's fear the is that perhaps that more people are going to leave, that we, in fact we, we, um, we will find ourselves in positions that are, uh, people are leaving in positions that we really have to fill and fill sure. immediately. So our, our pace of hiring might uh, actually increase and that could create a pressure. So we're going to monitor that and make sure that we can uh, manage it as best we can. And won't, if, those, if the civilian pitch, uh, positions that might not be front facing but they're really their support of the officers, um, does, uh, is that putting them at risk? Is that putting the ability for them to, to actually perform their duties at risk, they won't have that same level of support? Again, we're going to look at that to make okay. sure that that doesn't happen, but it is a risk, and that's why we wanted to identify it as such. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Councillor. Councillor Carroll next. That's a shame because I just put a mint in my mouth. <laughs> um, so, um, well, let's start here, premium pay. We've got a couple of new councillors on the committee. It's an issue this year because it's up and, and your, your, your position count is down. So let's start with what is premium pay? Who gets it? Is it different across the classes? Uh, just a quick 101. 
I'll start off. Basically, there's three categories of what we call premium pay. Um, it, the first category is somebody who's on a call, uh, it's the end of their shift, they have to stay a little bit longer to actually complete the call because you wouldn't want somebody else to come in. So that's basically overtime. Yeah. We also have to attend court for, for various uh, cases. And so usually that's done on, uh, uh, with using uh, on off days so that the people can actually investigate on their on days. Uh, so that's also another uh, example. And then the third one is where we call people back for special events or where we just need people because of certain uh, circumstances. We call them back on their days off and actually pay them uh, a premium pay a time and a half for that, for that time. Mm -hmm. So you're working on reducing it, but there's a certain amount of base premium pay that's, that has to be built into calls because we want them to finish a call. There's a certain amount that has to be built into courts because we don't want them to abandon, if, especially if they're, they're waiting uh, for a hearing and with a victim. We don't want them to walk away. And callbacks, while you're 8.5 up, this was an extraordinary year for callbacks, I would imagine. You had two big tragic events um, and, that, and, and a couple of very difficult cases. So I'm imagining you had incident reasons for it being high this year as well. It, that is correct. I, I'm certainly not going to define 2018 as a normal year. It certainly was not for many aspects, and we're not going to use that as a litmus test for uh, what our numbers look like. Right. But I can tell you one of the issues that we do have is with our frontline numbers of 4730, or, or with our uniform right. contingent 4730 or 4703, it does provide the opportunity for pressure on the premium pay. Now. Yeah weighing it out and looking at looking what our number has to be, what the right number has to be to be adequate and effective when it comes to policing, we're scaling up with a part-time piece so that we have the ability to manipulate to see exactly what we need on top of the premium pay components as well. So we're hoping that by utilizing the ability to surge up with resources, and when we talk about the resources that we're using, the alternative delivery methods, and when we have 40% of all of our calls are non-emergency calls, if we have those resources feeding into that aspect of policing, yeah. what it does is it frees up the frontline uniform officers from attending those calls. And so when we put that back and forth in relation to certain divisions that do have tremendous capacity when it comes to priority one, priority two, 51 division is one of the case in points. It has the highest rate of priority one, two, three calls across the city. Yeah that's where you're going to see the premium pay have an effect, where we need to build up the resources for not just the 40% of the non-emergency calls, right. but for those priority one, twos, and threes as well. But that's, because that's where I'm going. At a certain amount of it, you, you can calculate. But are you, while we're doing the way forward and while we're doing reductions, are you tracking also any of those where you're just straight shorthanded? So that you're not vulnerable to that accusation, you, you're, that your your officer complement is too low. We, we we anticipate we'll hear that from the association until the way forward is done. Are you tracking separately to make sure that you can you can confidently say that's not the case? Yeah. It, it, it. It depends on the narrative that you want to take. It's, it, it's easy to create the fear and, and yeah. have the right solutions. When we talk about the modernization plan, it's a sum of all parts equaling the whole. It's not just about getting bodies out. It, it's, as I stated earlier, leveraging technology, uh, alternate delivery methodology as well, too, and having the ability of also reinforcing that back end. So when we talk about the alternate delivery, when we talk about the uh, various things where we're not going to anymore, so unverified alarm reports for, or calls, for example, right. um, looking at things that we don't need to do anymore or doing the research to figure out how do we do it differently, these are all factors into the frontline pressure. So it's not just officer leaves, therefore we need to replace the officer. It, it's a whole host of things. Right. We are always monitoring to see what we are doing and what we need to do to fill those gaps to make sure that we do provide the adequate and effective policing. It's monitored on a regular basis. We have those meetings from an executive level to make sure that we have the, the, the right balance. It's never going to be a straight line and you can never okay. plan for crisis. Now in the, 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 the total positions, uh, uh, civilian and uniform, 7,881, the actual uh, projected actual is actually, it's almost 1,000 under that. So the question is, is before, I know there's a plan to hire up and, and get those uh, strategic positions into place, but has there also been a review uh, uh, functioning with that few down? Has there been a review to look at any of, that could just be deleted? 
Did that review take place among civilian staff? That is something, if you're talking question. civilian staff, that's something that we're going to be working on this year to see well, what positions are still necessary after the moratorium. Uh, right. And what positions can then be, uh, well, we'd have to look at the impact of actually eliminating that position. So that, that exercise is something that we are planning on doing. Oh, okay. So that'll happen within this year. So there is some hiring going on, but also some review of, yep. of, of the shift. Okay. Thanks, um, That's, oh, okay. we need a second round. We can come back for a second Yeah, because I, I got some board and parking tag questions. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Bradford. And Thanks very much. Uh, through the chair, thank you for the presentation. A uh, que couple questions uh, to the chief. Um, can you describe the safe summer plan and how that's uh, helping us address as a response to the gun violence in the city? Yeah, thank you, Council. The, the safe summer plan is just one of a multitude of plans. I, I, I think I mean, the, the assumption is that we don't plan to it until the summer. Uh, when it comes to the gun violence reduction plan, that is something that is ongoing on a day-to-day -day basis. I have people that are full-time to that when it comes to the intelligence services and what they do and their analytics to look at where we need to be and how. My specialized folks from Guns and Gangs are always uh, looking at what the new trends and patterns are, who the subjects are of in interest, working with the divisions on a day-to-day -day basis. When it comes to the summer piece, we always anticipate because we, we look at our trends and our patterns and we plan ahead. And that plan is going on right now to look at what are the opportunities, what are the issues that are out there when it comes to gun violence and can we do it through people, can we utilize it through technology and when you look at the results that we have, the results are very good. But um, I, I just want to be very clear that it, it's not a summer plan. It is always an ongoing plan, and that script does change at different times of the year depending on what the issues are and what the pressures are right across the city. Okay. Um, could you describe, uh, we've got the requests, uh, we have the neighborhood policing model and that pilot program right now, you talked about 33 neighborhoods expanding it to 60. Could we focus on um, how that program specifically works to address the gun violence piece? No, absolutely. And again, uh, this is where the plug-in is when, when we have different, uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all right across the city. Uh, the northwest end of the city has historically had the highest gun violence across the city. Um, but when we talk about the neighborhood uh, officer program and the benefits from it, looking at local issues and working with and creating stronger partnerships uh, gleans us a tremendous amount of intelligence and helps us tremendously cost savings because the public and the communities know where the issues are. Uh, number two, when you strengthen those relationships, you get richer information. And we know and we have seen uh, 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 with respect to the quality of information that is coming from the neighborhood officer program and how it plugs into our existing intelligence uh, entities, uh, the results have been tremendous. And so we're, we're looking forward at um, doing the research to see how can we enhance that. Uh, we had a meeting just a couple of weeks ago to figure out what methodology for tracking and measuring, uh, what, can, uh, we, what have we learned from this new program, and how can we make it a force multiplier uh, with the front line as well as with the specialized folks as well too and we're seeing very good results, very positive results, not just on the community relationship piece, but from the intelligence piece as well, strictly uh, uh, to the gun violence piece as well. Just to follow up on that, what are we, how are we approaching actually strengthening those relationships between Toronto Police Services and the neighborhoods and the communities with residents? Uh, that's, that's probably the intention of, of this program. What does that actually look like? Well, there, there are a multitude of avenues when it comes to strengthening community relationships. So on a monthly basis, all of the districts have the uh, Community Police Liaison Committee, where it's co-chaired by the, the uh, district commander as well as a member from the city uh, or from the, uh, that particular community right across the service. We have our consultative committees as well, which uh, meets on a monthly basis. Um, we also uh, have the, the neighborhood officer programs, our community response units right across the entire city on a regular basis. Are, are continuing to enhance the relationships. So it's not just neighborhood officer program. There is the commonality of having all of those entities report up to the executives. So we have an understanding of what the pulse is right across the city. We're always looking for the vulnerabilities. What are the issues? Where are the fragments within the community relationships? What do we need to do to develop them? And, and so it's a very cohesive piece 
uh, and it's evergreen, so we're always learning. Uh, we're never settling with what we have. There's, we're always looking for new opportunities to figure out how we can continue to grow and develop and strengthen those relationships for the sustainable solutions that we do in, right across the city. Thanks very much. Thank you. Other questions, Councillor McKelvey? Well, the, the, the neighborhood officer pilot speaks to the program that is going to be uh, full time at some point in time. Uh, the methodology behind it is it's a, a combination of working with academics to figure out how do we define and how do we measure properly, working with the community um, and also with us. Sometimes we tend to figure out that we know what value is, but uh, using the academic approach, using uh, the opportunities of working with the communities to have their voice, have equal voice, learning how we can leverage from the technology with our connected officers a classic example, and figuring out the framework from the pilot perspective so that we can build out from that. Getting it right from a pilot perspective, smaller, contained, gives us the opportunity to look at what the nuances are, and then expanding it is, is exactly the, the, what we're trying to do right now. So it's in pilot form right now, and we're looking for the opportunities for that expansion piece. But it also speaks to my number one priority right now, which is relieving the frontline pressures. The calls are going up. The gun violence is going up, and if I don't look after that, then I have the issue of bringing people in, building up, and then once I build up and maintain the numbers for the front line, I now have the opportunity for expanding in twofold. One, into the neighborhood officer program, and two, into the specialized. The specialized folks, they're honed in, hyper-focused strictly on who the most violent people are in the city, whether it's organized crime or whether it's a street gang, and then they make those apprehensions working with our frontline people. But the calls are up, the guns are, are prevalent, and, and right now from an officer safety perspective, that is my priority, to make sure I have the right number of frontline people working with technology, working on delivering uh, our alternate uh, delivery methodology and putting all of those pieces together to figure out what that number should be. So it will cease to be called a pilot when you get the full complement of neighborhood officers that you like to go to all priority neighborhoods. So it's not necessarily a change in techniques or methods you're using, it's just a, still called a pilot because right now it hasn't been fully implemented across the whole city? Uh, that's correct, and, and that's under the leadership of Deputy Ewan right now, who reports on a regular basis, so that any time we have to fill in those gaps, or any time there's an ability to learn from it to figure out how we can develop and expand and, and have more value in that program, so yeah, that's correct. And what are the funding sources that you're looking into for this program expansion, and how likely do you think it might be to, to get those funds? Are you looking at grant opportunities, for example, for... You know, all, all levels of government are, have, have been participants. The federal government, uh, about two weeks ago, just uh, uh, gave us a couple of million to, to help uh, deal with that neighborhood officer program and have different plugins in working with the, the city. The city has, has had some tremendous input uh, with other organizations as well to figure out how we can collectively maximize on, on developing stronger relationships. Okay, thank you. And then uh, on a complete pivot to a different line of questions. Um, is there a, a, a police auction annually and how much revenue is generated through that? Yeah, it's a good question. There is a police auction, but I, well, I can't, I don't know the number right now, but we certainly can get it for you. Okay, and, but it's not big. The, the total amount is, is fairly small. Yes, it's not that. Yeah. Um, and what happens with, uh, you've, you said throughout here that there's a thousand weapons that are seized annually. What happens with those? Well, generally, they're, they're, they're evidence-based, and, and so they have to go through the proper courtroom protocol, after which they're, they're destroyed. They're just, all weapons are destroyed. There's destroy no resale. So I think there's been some miscommunication, because I've heard at times that there are resales of firearms. So that definitely does not happen in any form here, and there's no, no. revenue being generated from seized weapons? No, you'd have to go south of the border for that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. I think that's good that we can clarify when people ask us that. So thank yes. you. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nunziata. Yes, thank you. And just um, <clears throat> further on the um, neighborhood policing model. So uh, we did at the Police Services Board uh, last day move a motion to ask the, the levels of government to um, for funding on that program, correct? Yes, that is correct. 
Yeah, so um, because it is very successful, and I think that's what uh, residents, especially in the priority neighborhoods, are asking for, that we need funding for that. Uh, the CPLC, just on the CPLC, we uh, are going to continue funding the CPLCs, correct? Yes, that's correct. It's a necessary component yeah. for us. It, it does give us the pulse of what's going on in the various districts, and we've seen some tremendous productivity from it. Okay, and... Um, Capital on page 33, uh, I see 12 division is in there. They're getting uh, new lockers and furniture replacement. Uh, yes, there there is uh, some that capital is very with good 12 news. division. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, page, and I know at the police services board that we when we went through the budget, unfortunately we weren't able with the disruptions, we weren't able to ask questions on the parking authority. But just going to page 37, um, can you explain um, where it says for the parking enforcement, pilot to move officers closer to where they enforce? So what's the plan on that? I wanted to ask that question at the board last week, but we didn't get a chance to. Right now, our officers are located in the east, uh, northeast part of the city, as well as the north part, west part of the city. And our analysis is showing that 70% of all tags issued are in the core. And so, one of the pilots has been started, that started is basically moving those officers closer to the way they enforce, so they could be more effective in terms of changing behavior by enforcing bylaws, um, and 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 therefore uh, helping to move traffic uh, better. We've started that pilot. It's been very successful. Right now, they actually lose probably uh, two hours just commuting back and forth from where they, uh, where they actually go to start their day and where they actually enforce. We want to change that. We want to put them closer to where they enforce so that they're much more effective, much more efficient, and basically be able to uh, uh, meet the objective of, of traffic flow. Yeah, so could they not, um, if they're coming from the east to the west, could they not go um, and go into one of the uh, closest divisions? and, re, you know, get, get it's exactly, organized. It's, it's that I type mean, of thing that we're looking at. So, so that's what you're looking at. So th there, would be a, uh, there would be a cost savings there, wouldn't there? No? We, we would certainly, um, we would vacate our current uh, facility in the northwest part of the city, and so we would save that lease. But I think what you're really looking at is increased efficiency and effectiveness in terms of enforcement, mm -hmm. hopefully changing behavior so that traffic, in fact, does flow a little bit better. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, any other questions? I think Councillor Carroll, we'll do second round if you have some more questions. Uh, yes, well, I'll stay on uh, 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 parking tags for a minute then since we're there. Um, on parking tags, there's a metric there for uh, officers responded to parking requests, parking uh, calls out, um, to re responded to and is relatively consistent around 160,000. Is that they responded to every call, or uh, is there a metric missing here of calls they weren't able to respond to? I can't really answer that question, but I can tell you that uh, of the 2 million calls that we get in 911, 150,000 of those are for parking complaints. And so yeah. what we've done now is actually give people the ability to make those complaints online, which then relieves our 911 operators and allows them to fo focus on true emergency calls. Uh, certainly, we can get the information in terms of how well we respond to those uh, uh, concerns, if I can call them that. And yeah. that de depends on the concern. But certainly, we do our best to, to go to where the concern is and try to uh, address it as best we can. Right. And, uh, and it, it says expected to, re to increase. Is that probably, that's probably the excess of being able to register them online. The success leads to an increase in demand. We, we don't know that yet. We just actually just started that, 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 that oh, new system. Okay. So certainly that's something that we're going to monitor. I think success would look like as close as, as many as we could get online would yeah. certainly, again, relieve our, our, front, our, our 911 pressure because they should be focusing on true emergency calls. Okay. And does that include, um, there's the call for, there's illegal parking in front of this house every night. Somebody's got to come by. Um, general uh, uh, parking problem. If someone says there's got to be a blitz because this street is always having, having uh, people parking and, and parking saying they're going in to get coffee and then the car just stays there. So there's those general street requests not come and tag this car right now. Is that factored in here to these calls? 
Because they're sort of like proactive calls. Are they factored in here? I'm, I'm hearing that they are not. Okay. So that's, that's another piece of unmet demand that I'm wondering about. The, uh, uh, it's, it's probably a range of things in the downtown core. In my area, it's the, uh, it's the, the rooming house thing. Come and tag these cars. They're parking all night in front of what I know is a rooming house. So if we're having an increase in demand over the next couple of years of just these calls, come and tag this car right now, but we're not in this metric including, can you generally come and blitz this neighborhood? That's an unmet need that we're not even forecasting staffing up to, to, uh, to be able to meet. Is that the case? So we maybe need to look at the uh, equation between revenue being collected and officers we need to be funding you for? We do do that in certain cases where mm -hmm. it is problematic and we get complaints and we have strategies in terms of how we then we try to deal with that, uh, that situation. Anecdotally, we hear though, when we do phone those in, what we hear from the divisions is, sorry, we don't have enough. We'll, we'll get there when we get there, sort of thing. So it's something that maybe the board needs to ask for analysis on, uh, what is that unmet need? Because if, if there's an equation between the revenue coming here and the officers needed to meet unmet need, we gotta look at it. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, another one, I'm, I hope you'll indulge me. I'm not quite understanding in the, in the board's budget um, how the missing persons inquiry is being funded. That's funding coming from, from council, um, but it, it says that the, the cost left over, there's still 180,000 or is it 1.8? I, I, I didn't quite get how it's documented there. Where are we at in terms of the transfer of the funds and is it meeting the needs of the inquiry? So the inquiry, um, we worked with uh, our city council counterparts to really divide up when that expense will be needed over the years. Ah. So the expense is being offset by the revenue. Right, but it's fully in reserve. There's not a case of uh, uh, um, you're waiting for the funds that we're not no. giving you. You're just taking the funds as needed. It's as needed. Up to the, I think it was two million that it's council three. set aside. Three, three. million yes. was approved. Okay. And so we've divided that up over the years, and and so that's reflected in the other expenditure with the offset in the revenue side. But there's no delay in you getting the funds no. to meet the invoices, Mike. No. Okay, excellent. Those are my questions. Thanks, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and um, we'll see you during the process. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <laughs> so next, um, we are going into presentations from community and social services. So just to reiterate, what we'll do is there'll be a presentation from the DCM on the entire cluster, I guess, the cluster A. After that, we will actually go and do questions of each individual division on the way down according to your sheet, which is the um, review schedule sheet. So I'll just give a minute or two just to uh, switch over, and then we'll begin with that. And if I could have everyone in the back just uh, exit the room as quickly as possible so we can get to the next presentation. I think we're ready, yep. Just, just give it 30 seconds just to okay it's all yours good morning everyone thank you for this opportunity to present community and social services budget so the presentation is just going to provide a very high level overview of our capital and operating budget there is more detail provided in the appendices and of course in the budget notes. I'm not gonna be speaking in detail to all of the slides, but of course we're all gonna be here to answer questions at the end. 
So that's just a list of the appendices. And we're going to start just with a brief overview of the program areas. So community and social services includes 10 program areas. They're each responsible for delivering a variety of services. Those services are identified in this slide and they're described in the budget notes. The next two slides just highlight some of the key capital assets that the program areas maintain and operate in the delivery of their various services. And there's quite a variety ranging from childcare, heritage, ambulance stations, um, our social assistance offices, right through to shelters and our extensive network of park and parks and recreation assets. In terms of our workforce, it's just over 13,100 positions. That includes 221 positions for capital and 22% of the positions are 2,900 approximately are temporary positions and a lot of those are in parks, forestry and recreation. In fact, our entire, a third of our entire workforce is in parks, forestry and recreation. So we're now going to move to budget highlights and I'm just going to start by just reviewing some of 2018's key achievements and experiences. So I would say that last year was a challenging year, not only for our cluster but for the city, but I think it was also a pretty productive year. We did continue to advance Council's poverty reduction strategy, approving new affordable housing units, adding childcare spaces as well as fee subsidies, transforming TCHC's rooming houses into supportive housing for vulnerable tenants, and that includes tenants with some pretty complex needs. We connected over 7,000 youth to employment and over 8,000 individuals and families to housing. We also supported over 5,000 uh, households with housing allowances so that they could stay housed. And we expanded our shelter and our respite programs by 1,600 shelter beds and 400 respite sites. In fact, since 2016, we've actually added approximately 3,000 shelter beds and we're now up to approximately 800 respite sites. We've also launched Council's uh, Transit uh, Fair Pass program or Fair Equi Transit Fair Equity program. Phase one of that program was launched. We issued over 37,000 passes to eligible social assistance clients. We established the Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit that was to oversee and manage the implementation of Council's action plan to confront anti-black racism. And I think you're all aware that February is Black History Month and we're so excited that our newly established black staff network of almost 400 staff is hosting the first ever corporate launch for Black History Month tomorrow evening in the Rotunda from 6 to 8. So we're hoping to see many of you there. The city also negotiated our first community benefits agreement as part of the expanded um, wood buying gaming and that's the first of agreement if it, in its kind in Canada so we're all very proud of that. Now sadly 2018 was also a year marked with increased violence and tragedy in our, in our communities and our small but mighty uh, crisis response unit responded to over 650 violent and traumatic events across the city. On a more positive note, we launched the four public benefit uh, policy and that's focused on strengthening our relationship with the nonprofit sector. We work very closely with the nonprofit sector in helping advance a lot of our poverty reduction goals and other priorities that the council has. We've reached the council's art and culture investment goal of $25 per capita and Toronto's film and television industry attracted production activity that's valued in the range of over $1.8 billion. There's a number of other successes that are identified on this slide. I'm not going to speak to them all in the interest of time, but I do want to highlight that Council's contribution to TCHC State of Good Repair actually allowed TCHC to bring back online 143 units that had actually been previously closed, so that's quite an accomplishment. In terms of challenges, I think a lot of the challenges that community and social services face are faced with uh, similar to other challenges across the city that the different program areas are seeing. And I think it's largely related to the changing needs of a growing and evolving city. But in community and social services, we're particularly challenged trying to meet the complex needs of Toronto's more vulnerable residents, families and communities. We're seeing an aging population, youth unemployment, you're all familiar with the affordability issue, there's precarious employment and, and a growing social and income divide and across our different neighbourhoods. But we're very much focused on making things better and Council has adopted 
Um, oh, sorry. Before I move on to that, the, there's also other challenges in terms of um, provincial changes. You're all aware that a lot of our services that we do in community and social services are legislated and funded by the province. And therefore, as, they, as the province looks and examines some of its uh, areas like housing and social assistance, we pay close attention and we participate in provincial consultations because any changes there could impact our service delivery. But we're always focused on continuing to leverage to the full extent possible any provincial or federal programs to help advance Council's priorities. Now, refugee claimants, they continue to arrive into the city at a, at a steady pace. So unlike other influxes that we've seen over the years on refugees. They've lasted for around a year and then they've gone back to normal levels. This influx or surge in refugees has been pretty consistent for the past two years and I think we've come to realize that this may be the new norm and recognizing that we have asked the federal government to provide annual ongoing funding to help sustain the 2,500 beds that have been added to our shelter system to accommodate this uh, continued surge in refugee claimants. So as I mentioned, we do have plans and strategies in place that Council's approved to help us um, overcome and address the challenges and needs that we're seeing. And we're going to continue to move forward on advancing these strategies. I'm not going to name them all. Many of you are familiar with them and we do provide uh, regular status reports on where we're at to Committee and Council and those reports are also posted on the City's website. So other key priorities for 2019 are going to include scaling up our capacity to deliver more affordable housing. We are developing a new housing plan. Our current plan expires this year and we'll be bringing forward later this year the new 10-year plan for housing. And that's to understand and address the needs across the full spectrum of housing, whether it be shelters, long-term care homes, trans transitional and supportive housing and affordable housing. And of course, we're going to be focused on implementing Council's recently approved Housing Now program. We're also stepping back and doing a full comprehensive review of all the youth services that are provided by the City to understand what's truly effective and what's really driving to the outcomes that we need as a City. We'll be bringing forward the next term action plan. So for this term of Council, there will be a new action plan coming forward on how we drive and continue to move forward on the 20-year poverty reduction strategy. So we just completed the first uh, term action plan and we'll bring it, bring, bring it back the next one shortly. We'll continue to monitor and manage the demand for uh, shelter services and we're continuing to deliver on Council's promise to add a thousand uh, new shelter beds by 2020. So there's 400 planned for 2019 and the balance, the 500 that are needed to, come to reach that thousand are planned for 2020. And we're going to be reporting back on Council's ask on how best to um, create a services, a seniors housing and services entity for the city and that should be coming before uh, Council's adjourns this summer. So business transformation and, um, and modernization is a key focus not only for community and social services but all the program areas across the city. This slide only gives you a very small sampling of what's being done. There's more detailed listing in the appendices. But please know that all of our transformations are always focused on our clients and our customers and how best to improve services and outcomes for both for families, for individuals and for communities. And we always look from both a system-wide perspective as well as a service level perspective. So now we'll get into the operating budget and the 2019 gross operating budget that's being recommended for community and social services is approximately $4 billion. And almost 30% of that is for employment and uh, social services. 25% 25, 25 is dedicated to shelter, housing and administrative, administ housing administration. That includes $243 million, that's uh, the subsidy that the city provides to TCHC. Children's services and parks, forestry and recreation account for 16% and 12% respectively and the balance is divided among the remaining program areas. Now in terms of funding sources, that's the pie chart on the right. As I mentioned, many of our um, programs are cost shared with other orders of government, so it's not surprising to see that 59% of our funding sources come from provincial and federal subsidies. A third comes from the property tax base and user fees make up just, un just under 5%. In terms of the net budget, that's the amount that's funded 
from property tax, we're at 1.2 billion, and housing and parks, forestry, and recreation combined account for approximately 65% of that net budget. So this is a summary of our net recommended budget for 2019 by program area with a comparison to 2018. And despite some significant pressures that we saw this year, and I'm going to speak to in a minute, the overall budget is 1.4% above the approved 2018 budget. That does include 8.8 .8 million in recommended new and enhanced services to help address a growing demand and need for social, recreational, and community services and supports. The recommended budget, as the city manager mentioned in, at the budget launch, also includes 45.4 million in federal funding that has been requested to cover the annualized costs of the 2,500 beds that have been added to our shelter system for refugee claimants. And the slight decrease you see, the $356,000 decrease for TCHC isn't so much related to a decrease in subsidy as it is to 465 mortgage agreements that they have that have now expired, so mortgage payments are no longer required. So in terms of our key cost driver, we have our most significant pressure is just annualizing the cost of three different shelter programs that were approved last year. So the addition of the 2,500 beds for um, refugees, the cost of expanding our respite uh, services to be a year-round 27, um, seven-day-a-week service, and the opening of seven new shelters to meet that uh, 1,000 new beds by 2020. We also have our normal uh, pressures that you're familiar with that we see every year related to inflation, annualization of uh, new services and operating impacts of capital. Offsetting these uh, pressures are some revenue changes. So we have increased court fines that are la largely associated with the expansion of red light cameras across the city. We have some additional provincial funding and paramedic services for their communication center and ambulance operations. We have an inflationary increase on user fees and we do have a 1% above inflation increase on parks, forestry, and recreation fees. We do have some service efficiencies largely related to streamlining and consolidation of operations, and that's largely in the test area with, and some in long-term care. And there's a $45 million ask from the federal government. So, so I just want to highlight the fact that this $45 million federal funding ask is over and above the $12 million that's embedded in our base budget for shelters that covers the cost of 400 beds that we have in our shelter system that for years has accommodated refugees and newcomers to the city. So all we're asking the federal government to fund is the additional beds that we've had to add to accommodate this consistent surge that we've seen um, in refugee claimants coming to the city over the past 10 years, 12, sorry, two years. We don't see or anticipate. There's nothing that would tell us or indicate that there's going to be a decrease in this new level that we're seeing. As I say, there's 18 to 20 that are arriving daily. Staff are doing a tremendous job getting them housed, but they continue to come in faster than we can get them housed. So in terms of new and enhanced, I mentioned that there's 8.8 .8 on a net basis that's been added across nine different program areas. Uh, the details are in the appendices. Just to highlight some key enhancements, we are recommending a $3.7 million contribution to child care, and that's the 20% that the city as um, council has asked us to maintain in terms of matching provincial funding. We have $2.4 million for phase two of transit fair equity. $2.5 million is going towards the youth equity strategy that council approved. There's 1.5 million for parks, forestry, and recreation. That covers a number of things, including 7,500 additional uh, recreational spaces. And on the next slide, we actually show the new and enhanced by service objective or theme. Before I wrap up operating, I just want to touch on TCHC. As a reminder, the TCHC subsidy that the city provides is embedded within Shelter Support and Housing Administration. And through the 2018 budget last year, Council did approve an interim funding strategy to help address TCHC's operating and capital pressures over the two years 18 and 19. So on the operating side, the 2019 subsidy, as I mentioned, is slightly lower, and that's because of the expiring mortgage uh, arrangements. On the capital side... 
they have 465 mortgage agreements that have now expired. So the amount they have to pay out on mortgages has gone down. And we pay that based on actuals. Okay? So on the capital side, the 10-year plan that Council approved on the, as part of the interim funding strategy included $2,016 million for 2018 and $62 million for 19, and that $62 million is embedded in the 10-year recommended plan that's before you today. That $278 million over the two years allows TCHC to continue moving forward on its capital repair program and continuing development on uh, revitalization projects that are in flight that Council has already approved. The 10-year plan, however, doesn't include anything for 2020 and beyond, and that's because we were asked to come back with a permanent funding fo formula to address TCHC's operating and capital later this year, well in advance of the 2020 budget. Okay? This is just a summary of TCHC's uh, capital and operating budget. They look at it combined, and you'll see that the vast majority is dedicated to building repairs utilities and debt payments. And in terms of the funding sources, 30% of their budget is covered from residential rents, and then the city's operating subsidy and the debt funding cover approximately 29%. So we'll now quickly look at our capital budget. So major projects in the 10-year capital plan in include advancing the city and council approved facilities master plan for recreation. That's including a lot of new community centers, pools, arena, and other recreational facilities. Very exciting is the George Street Revitalization Project, which will see Scene House redeveloped into an integrated community facility with a community hub, long-term care, and housing across a broad spectrum of needs. So right from not only shelters, but transitional and supportive housing, as well as affordable housing. Also embedded in that 10-year plan is a thousand new beds for shelters, three more multifunction station for paramedic services, more parks, the replacement of our three ferry boats, and restoration of Casaloma. And of course, state of, good, state of Good Repair continues to be a key focus over the next 10 years, with over a billion dollars devoted to this uh, particular uh, area. So the 10-year capital plan totals almost 3.2 billion. Almost 60% of that is directed to parks, forestry, and recreation. 28% is directed to shelter support and housing administration and the George Street Revitalization Project. The balance is distributed among other program areas. In terms of the funding sources, 1.7 billion is funded through debt, so that's almost 54%. Development charges fund 23%, and our reserves and reserve funds cover 14%. So the, rec the recommended 10-year capital plan is dominated by service improvement projects. That, that makes up 39% of the plan. 1.3 billion, and state of good repair, as I mentioned, is just over a billion, and that's 33% of the plan. Growth related is, represents 26%, and that big spike you see in 2023 is the completion of the construction for our George Street Revitalization Project, and so the, the vast majority of those funds get paid out at that time. In terms of our state of good repair backlog, it's just over 611 million in 2019. That's 16% of asset value. It peaks at 726 million in 2025, and it drops slightly after that. So just in conclusion, there are a number of projects that are not included in the 10-year capital plan, but the most significant of those are the five long-term care homes that the city uh, owns and operates and runs that need to be rede redeveloped in order to comply with new design standards. So we, we will be working closely with financial planning through the 2020 budget to see how we can bring some of those um, above the line for future years. That concludes my presentation and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Now, a couple of things. Do we have any questions? What, what we generally do is we go through each individual division, going uh, the list is affordable housing, children's services, court services, all the way down if you have, and these are the analyst notes. Um, that's how we've done it in the past. It'll give more opportunity to get a little more in depth. So if everyone's okay with that, we'll, we'll begin. Okay. So we'll begin, we'll start at the top of the page, affordable housing. Do we have questions? We're gonna start with affordable housing. Affordable Housing Office. Councillor, and we'll do outside councillors and inside. Councillor Perks. Yeah, um, 
Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm looking at the analyst notes, particularly uh, the service performance measures on page 12. Uh, number of low-income households assisted repairs modifications completed, and I noticed that that's dropping substantially from 2018. What's the cause of that? He's coming. There he is. <laughs> hey, Sean. Morning, Councillor. Uh, the reason uh, through the chair for the uh, lower numbers is uh, because we're taking fewer uh, multi-residential buildings now when we're focusing the programs more specifically to single uh, homeowners that are qualified for the program. So that's a policy choice that we made? Uh, through the chair, it's not a policy change. It's adjusting relative to the amount of funds that we're receiving from the federal and provincial governments to deliver that program. Ah, so we're adjusting our program because we're getting less partnership money from other orders of government. That would be correct. And Adam Vaughn told me we solved all those problems. Um, well, he did. I'm going to have to get on Twitter later on and see if I can provoke him. Um, uh, Councillor, uh, uh, Councillor Perks, through the chair, if I could, um, if I could indicate as well that we are awaiting news uh, from the uh, provincial government as to whether they will honour year six of the program, which What's would that be, program called? Which would be effective April the first of uh, 2019, and in the absence of getting a positive response for the program, um, it will not be possible to deliver that program. What's that program called, please? It's the Investment in Affordable Housing Program, Year 6. Investment in Affordable Housing. Okay. Um, now, this isn't in the analyst notes, but uh, in the overall presentation that the Deputy City Manager just gave, the slides, slide number 86. Uh, it shows the the year-over-year -year increase in the number of shelter beds, capacity, capacity growing. Um, and then it shows that for uh, this year, next year, and the year after, the number of individuals housed from shelters is flatlined. Through the chair, um, this is uh, a point in time, what we're doing currently, and it's I'm based... I'm wondering if... No, I'm asking the Affordable Housing Office. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I understand, like, you provide the shelters. What I'm, what I'm seeing, though, is that the number of individuals housed from shelters does not increase. Do we not have a program there, or...? So, through the chair, our staff working with the shelter providers do the work to find housing for individuals from uh, the shelter system. That has dramatically increased over the last two years. Um, this is an estimate, estimate based on the current level of demand that we're seeing in the shelter system today. So, and that's why you're seeing that flat line into the future. So, you're showing the demand is increasing because the number of people in our shelter system is increasing and there's no increase in the number of people we're placing into housing. That's what these two graphs show me, page 86, you can have it up. Yep, I have it in front of me. Yeah. Um, yes, and again, we're just forecasting into the future based on uh, the market, all of the challenges to get people housed. This would change if there were different programs related to supportive housing and those That's types of things. That's why I was asking the Affordable Housing Office. So, so we're not providing or, or don't forecast this year, next year, or the year after providing more opportunity for supportive housing so that we can deal with the fact that shelter use is growing. We're providing those programs. So through the chair, part of the, as I mentioned in my presentation, we are just updating our housing plan for the next 10 years. Part of that is going to be looking at the full understanding and looking at the full spectrum of housing needs, including supportive and transitional housing. Okay, maybe I can ask someone from finance then because this is the second time I've heard that. So we're not putting in any notional number 
for this. We're not putting in any notional number for TCHC. We're just flatlining everything until we get the housing opportunities plan. Last question. To you, Mr. Chair, um, that is correct. We have not put a provisional amount. It is clearly one of our key SOGR priorities for next year's budget process. But we do need to understand all the pieces in relation to each other and look at our various funding opportunities. I'm going to have to have a second round on that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cressy. Thank you. Um, so to Sean <laughs> from the Affordable Housing Office. So on the supportive housing front, uh, as I'm going through the analyst notes, what money is set aside or, or how many units are proposed to be built in 2019 and 2020 for new supportive housing at this time? Uh, through the chair, um, there are three particular projects that are underway now, um, which include uh, the revitalization within um, the St. Hilda's Towers, uh, where there's 170 vacant units currently. As well, um, the 389 Church Street uh, project will open in 2020. That's the conversion of the Toronto Community Housing property. All of those units will have supports attached to those. And as well, the Winchester homes uh, are also actually today the interior demolition has started. Um, so we're anticipating there'd be in excess of 300 supportive housing units that would be opening in 2020, 2021. And are, are those 300 units are those net new supportive housing units, just to be clear? They are net new, uh, particularly because they also um, uh, are um, attracting uh, supportive housing services uh, through the province of Ontario funding, as well as rent supplement so that they can be um, rented at a, um, at a rate that would be equivalent to someone who would be paying an RGI uh, housing rate. So these are funded through the provincial government's Homes for Good funding, is that? Through the chair, that's correct. Okay, and the Homes for Good funding, how much has been provided to the city for 2019 through the federal government's Homes for Good funding? Uh, through the chair, uh, the Homes for Good program is 100% uh, provincially funded. Yeah. Um, and we're in the last year of that program. Uh, so there is uh, no 2019-2020 uh, allocation. So the new units that are coming on board are based on previous provincial funding. So in terms of supportive housing, so there is no new funding coming from the province as of now that we're aware of. That through the chair, uh, there is no new commitments that have been made since the recent government was elected. Um, there were commitments made during the election it remains to be seen um, uh, what comes of that. Have we, through the Affordable Housing Office, have we put any funding requests into the federal government through the co-investment fund for supportive housing? Uh, through, through the chair, uh, we're reliant upon the organizations that would sponsor uh, projects. The city itself is not um, a developer in that respect. Um, and uh, we have uh, supported the Wood Green Community uh, Group uh, with a project on Girard Street, which is the one project in Toronto that has received co-investment funding. So uh, has the city, is the city aware of we partnered with any other organizations beyond that one with Wood Green to request funding from the federal government for supportive housing? <coughs> Uh, through the chair, we've also partnered uh, with uh, Mizio Beak Services with respect to Aboriginal housing on Homewood Avenue in downtown Toronto. Um, and further to Council's um, request last week, shelter housing and support, and my office will be meeting to discuss um, working with supportive housing agencies in the course of the next 10 days yeah. to figure out what, what further applications might be made. Okay. So I guess, and, and, and I don't mean to probe too deeply, I'm just trying to understand it. So as it relates to supportive housing, the city's role today is to look at the Housing Now program with respect to some, uh, and to partner with nonprofits towards seeking funds from the federal government, 
and perhaps to administer funds through the provincial government. That is the extent of our supportive housing work today. Would that, is that right? Uh, through the chair, um, given the resources available, that is the responsible course of action to take relative to how would we scale up this program um, in a way that um, was realistic and achievable. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the com committee members. Councillor Bradford. Thanks very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, through the chair, um, to Mr. Gadden, um, the Affordable Housing Office Budget refers to the national housing strategy in conjunction with the provincial uh, government's three-year action plan. Um, what asks are we specifically uh, requesting from from the province and the federal government? Thank you for the question. Through the chair, uh, the most specific ask uh, relates to the program that was approved last week at City Council through the Housing Now Initiative to seek uh, federal support in the form of low interest financing for those 10,000 housing units, the, the rental housing component of those, um, as well as uh, rents up and other uh, supports that residents would require. Thank you. Um, do we have a sense of how much Section 37 money uh, was leveraged through developments in 2018 and what percentage of that might have been directed towards affordable housing initiatives? Through the chair, I'd be happy to get you that information, Councillor. I don't have it at my fingertips. Okay. My colleagues in uh, planning probably do, but um, I, if I could uh, report Again, back to you yep. on that, I'd be happy to do that. Great, thank you. Um, when we think about the changes um, with provincial level legislation with respect to inclusionary zoning, um, have we thought about what the estimated cost might be of implementing that sort of a policy on our own? Uh, through the chair, the inclusionary zoning is a, a matter that our um, planning department will be reporting back to the planning and housing committee on um, in the second quarter of this year. Uh, it's a complicated policy insofar as um, the um, city has to uh, amend the official plan to achieve it and then the minister has to approve it at the province. Uh, relative to going it alone, um, uh, that's a matter I think we should take up in the Planning and Housing Committee relative to what powers the city has to um, achieve of inclusionary zoning uh, in the absence of uh, the province approving it. Right. Um, the report notes desired changes for the inclusionary zoning policy resulting from kind of a lack of municipal flexibility there. Are there changes that we should be advocating for uh, to make that policy more flexible uh, and increase the ability for us to deliver on that? Is there anything that we should be calling out? Uh, through the chair, um, I th think the regulations, uh, I was heavily involved both with the legislation and the regulations with uh, the province and uh, with our uh, chief planner um, are fairly broad and, and uh, are not as are, are not prescriptive in the sense that it allows a fair amount of flexibility for the city. Uh, the real question will be um, uh, whether the province uh, leaves those regulations in place and allows us the discretion that they cur that currently exists. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Um, just a couple of questions. So uh, the, the Housing Now report that was passed, it was a pretty complex, sorry, Councillor Perks, can you just, and now I get to see Sean. Um, the Housing Now, it was a pretty complex arrangement of staff involvement in, uh, in the projects. Could you discuss what pressures that might put on the Affordable Housing Office specifically? Uh, through the chair. What new work did we give you? Yes, no, if you look at the presentation before you uh, in terms of the budget notes, there's close to 50 projects that are being monitored and, and are active in our office, uh, particularly as a result of the open door program as well. Um, and so with respect to the pressures, that's why the proposal that was approved by council last week included the additional staff positions, including the housing secretariat, which was to essentially um, get some um, reinforcements, if I could say that. 
So are those included in the proposed staff recommended operating budget here? Uh, Councillor, the um, funding of the positions that were proposed uh, comes from the city building fund, so they don't, uh, they're not reflected in terms of the uh, ask to council uh, for the operating dollars. So through the chair, just to clarify, because it was only recently approved, we will be working with finance to amend probably through the first variance report to amend that, but we, we do have authority to proceed. I, okay, I've got a shaking head over here, so I just want to get some clarity on this, because this is kind of the basis for my questions, is resources to let Sean and his team do his job. So through you, Mr. Chair, that report last week that you adopted referred that particular recommendation to the budget Correct. process, so that will get amended as it comes forward. Here. So that that is an amendment that's going to happen by staff, or is that happening, does that have to happen by this committee? It will happen through the committee as we go through this process when we wrap up. And where, in the wrap up, what is the revenue source for that? It's the city building fund. Okay. So this is a capital transfer? This is a transfer from city building fund that is a dollar, is a cash value that will go into a reserve in affordable housing and that will be used for that purpose. Okay. So but it, it, it was intended to be for capital work, if I'm not mistaken. This is the city building fund that started with the Scarborough subway that turned into the city building fund, R right? So through you, Mr. Chair, uh, it was intended as a funding source for both housing and transit. Yes. And for the purposes of the work being do done here through the Housing Now, we are uh, essentially drawing on the reserve in cash, not in debt, and putting that into the affordable housing reserve fund to then be used for the combination of all the efforts I outlined in the housing. And, and what's that amount? Because that's not reflected in that. What, what is the amount that the draw would be from that reserve? It's $20 million as you approved last week. So $20 million on an annual basis will no. be the cost of implementing? What, what would be the cost that would show up in this budget as an addition to a it was through you, Mr. Chair. It was uh, about $2 million, I believe, roughly. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but it would have been for the cost of the positions that you're going to be adding to this particular budget, and then we'll be starting the work on studies and stuff. But those positions are, are permanent positions, correct? No, through you, Mr. Chair, they're temporary or for They're temporary years. positions. For what was the term of how long those, petitions, those positions? I believe it's four years. Four years. Thank you. They're here for four years, and we'll, when we do the housing plan, we'll also look at how we can integrate that secretariat and those resources with the affordable housing office to create one structure, once we know the full spectrum of what we're going to be building out. Okay. Um, on, the, uh, on page 10 of the analyst notes, it just, just a very quick question. In last year or the year, prior year's budget, we, did we not transfer money to the Affordable Housing Office to do their own legal support? Or am I getting it in reverse? Did we dedicate legal support outside of the Affordable Housing Office? I just recall that we've had this conversation before, and I'm wondering if rather than an interdepartmental transfer, wouldn't it be better to move another legal body into affordable housing? Or am I getting, am, am I getting it reversed? Did we, did we have a dedicated, did legal add someone to dedicate to you in the last budget, or did you add someone on your staff as your legal support, and you just need more uh, because of the complexity? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, so you're right, there was an additional person added uh, through an interdivisional charge, um, and we're adding another because of uh, the complexity and also as part of a succession planning. Um, and the hope, uh, oh, I may have hit my last question. I didn't think I was that long. But. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, um, we'll go on to children's services. Still, oh, yes, Councillor. I have a, a question about process. So there are a number of uh, questions that I had that have to do with the whole division. Mm -hmm. when, when would you like me to do that? You mean the whole? Like, Sorry, the whole, whole cluster. Cluster. Like the whole cluster. cluster. Um, let's. I know. 
Why don't just uh, like four or five minutes of overarching questions? Okay. Do we? Ha is it? It's up to the committee if we want to. Okay. I'm comfortable doing doing them. This is based on the presentation and. Yeah, based well. on the presentation, just to okay. Of overarching. We good with that? Okay. okay. Council Perks, go. Um. So in the in the presentation towards the start, you listed a number of uh, city strategies. Our our uh, anti-poverty strategy. Uh, fair equity, there's a whole series of them that were listed. And one of the, the problems I've been having reading the analyst notes of individual departments that deliver pieces of those services is I can't, I, I can find we're doing project X as part of that strategy, but I can't find any reference to how the departmental budgets are doing in terms of the timing approved by council. So council said, we're going to do X amount on the poverty reduction strategy over this many years. But I can't find anything in analyst, the analyst notes that says, are we on track for that council-approved timetable? Are we behind the council-approved timetable? Are we ahead of the council? And this is for all KPI the different... We for strategies. I know. Well, council did approve these. If, uh, there's, there's the list. The senior strategy, the youth equity strategy, <laughs> the strong neighborhood strategy. Through the chair. With regard to poverty reduction, we actually, I, I believe there should be a briefing note before you, but we also report out uh, annually on each, each of these strategies in terms of status and where we're at, either annually or biannually, depending on the length. But we normally provide updates to council and to committee, and those updates are also um, posted on, on, on the city's website. I, I, but the and, and poverty I, reduction, I believe there's a briefing note that's been... I, I'm not asking specifically oh. about... I'm just asking a generic question. So I can't evaluate the budget in front of me against those strategies unless I go and look up each individual strategy and read through every department's budget to see whether it's on pace with what we approved. You don't have a, a summary somewhere of how well we're doing with these. Well, through the chair, that's correct. It's something we could consider for, for future, but you're, you're correct. There's nothing that summarizes each of them in the analyst notes. The analyst notes are done by program area, but I can, we can work for financial planning to try and provide that in a briefing note format for each of the major strategies. Well, I, I don't want to sound snarky here, but I mean, where in, in each of the analyst notes where you do something under one of these strategies, you, you say successes this year, and then you list the thing you're doing under those strategies. There's no uh, complimentary thing saying failures this year where we didn't do the thing that we said was supposed to happen this year for that strategy. Through the chair, there are two briefing notes. Um, briefing note number five on the Toronto Youth Equity Strategy, which identifies both the successes and the work yet to be done, and the overall cross-corporate investments. So I have that for youth equity, okay. You, on briefing note number six, there is a similar summary for the poverty reduction strategy. Okay, good. Other strategies, we haven't done that uh, cross-corporate summary. I smell a briefing note request. Uh, I'm hearing a briefing Thank note request. Thank you for request. your indulgence, Mr. Okay. Mr. Chair. And no problem. Thank you. Okay, let's go on to um, children's services. Oh. oh. Those were the overall. Oh, overall. Yeah, I apologize. Did you, Councillor Cressy, did you want to do overall questions? I can do overall now. Okay. I can do some overall just to save time rather than coming back for SSHA. I am trying to understand where in the city the responsibility lies for not administering but building more supportive housing. So through the chair, we've always worked with the province and other nonprofit sector organizations to build supportive housing. As part of the new housing plan, so our the housing plan that's being wrapped up now focused largely on affordable housing. The new housing plan is going to look at, understand, and look at the full spectrum of housing needs. So we're hoping that that, I can promise you, that'll be a lot more encompassing in terms of what we need right through the full spectrum. So from shelters to supportive, transitional, long-term care, and affordable housing. So we continue, as, per, as I said in my presentation, we will always focus on leveraging provincial and federal programs to help advance that goal. Supportive housing, we always 
A lot of the supports that are required are going to be in the health area, which we have to work with the LINs or the province on trying to integrate those in. With the, with the rooming houses at TCHC, we were very successful in transforming those rooming houses to over 200 of them to supportive housing, and we'll continue to do that work. So just, and this is the interdivisional piece for me. So when you said how it's always been, so traditionally, is it SSHA that administers the supportive housing grants that we receive? And is it in the affordable housing office that, that coordinates the joint requests for funding to the other levels of government with nonprofits? So through the chair, SSHA and affordable housing work jointly on doing the submissions to the province and the feds. We do it because we want to make sure it's, we captured everything, that, so they tend to work quite closely together. And then affordable housing, if there's actual new development that needs to, an RFP that has to go out for construction and actual new development, affordable housing tends to take the lead on that particular aspect. And then SSHA will work with the nonprofit se sectors, the LINs, to make sure we bring the supportive aspects into those units. So then can I ask on an intergov basis, uh, and I don't know where this will go, if it's to our city manager or other. So council has an approved target of 18,000 new supportive housing units over the next 10 years, correct? Um, correct. That's correct. And so we do not know what the province is coming for, forward with post homes for good. We know that all they have committed 1.9 billion, I believe, in providing um, mental health. So we're monitoring that very closely so that we can leverage those opportunities to drive additional supportive housing. We always communicate that message when we're dealing with. So that's on mental health services, but in terms of a home building fund out of the province, we do not have any information of new funding coming. Not, not at this not time. Not at this time. So on the federal level, that 900 million or so price tag for the 18,000 units that council has directed, is there a current formal request in through the city to the national housing strategy for that $900 million to build? Because I know we have a request in through the national housing strategy for 900 or so million dollars for TCHC, State of Good Repair, but is there a formal request in for supportive housing dollars? My previous question was to Sean, to the affordable housing office earlier, and he was saying we only partner with nonprofits for those asks. But I guess I'm asking whether we have formally put in a request to the feds as the city for supportive housing. So, through the chair, my understanding is that we put in funding to build additional affordable housing units. Then, once we get funding for the, affor the additional affordable housing units, including the ones that we've identified under housing now, we do have that directive from council to look at bringing in supports into those units. So they go from being not only affordable, but also supportive. And that's, that's how we leverage those dollars. I'm not aware of a specific federal program dedicated to supportive housing, but as I say, we leverage those programs to the full extent possible. And as we build affordable housing units, we look to secure the supportive dollars from the healthcare sector, from the province, from other nonprofits to bring those supports in, just like we did with the rooming houses. And I see Mr. Murray is coming in, and then I'm finished my questions. Sure, if I can, through the chair, I'm, uh, I agree with what uh, Julianne has just mentioned, but I'll just double check to make sure that there's nothing we're missing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Layton, did you have some questions, overall questions? Uh, yes, thank you very much. First on the, the use, or, sorry, the OW reserve wi withdrawal, it's a three million, is it co connected directly to a the one-time draw from OW Reserve, page 22 of the slide deck, is it directed uh, or is it connected directly with a division or a, a specific service? <laughs> it's connected. So as you're aware, last year we, um, our, our provincial funding for uh, social assistance has gone down because the case light, caseload has gone down. So in or as we streamline our processes in order to downsize to meet that new level of provincial funding. We have used that reserve to help transition us from where we are to where we need to be. So was that the intended purpose of that reserve? It was. That, that was the intended purpose. My, I wasn't here, but back in the day, 
when all of a sudden the, um, the caseload jumped, they decided after that experience to put aside a reserve um, to help manage the, the ups and downs of the caseload. And how much does three million represent of that reserve? Fraction of a percent, a whole lot. of the current reserve. Um, the total amount in the reserve is, sorry. For you, Mr. Chair, the uh, ending balance at the end of de December 31st, 18 is $18 million. And this will take it down uh, to about $15 million. Okay, thank you. Um, the, uh, what, what inflationary rate was used? Like, how did we calculate the inflationary rate used for the whole city versus this cluster? Like, is there a breakdown? I'm just really curious about how, how we came up with the number for the entire budget versus the number being used by divisions. So through you, Mr. Chair, annually when we establish uh, the directions for the budget, general CPI Toronto amount that we use as a general amount but then there are specific amounts associated with particular expenditures so it really depends what we're applying it to so for example you know food might have its own we have a, a list sure. but uh, then there's a generic amount and then when folks are determining their uh, inflationary increases for user fees that's based on a basket of goods so a division comes in with their own inflationary rate only as it relates to user fees that are uh, for a particular service based on the cost of those services. Okay, and what was the citywide number that we used? It was, uh, the general CPI was 2.1, I believe. And what did we use for Parks and Rec, for the user fee for Parks and Rec? They used 3.1? 3.07? 3.07, yes. And that won't be the only increase on user fees at Parks and Rec? It's 3.07. There's an above inflation increase of one. Oh, there's Jake. There's a. Through, through the chair, we use 3.07 as the base inflationary increase, looking at what we call a basket of goods within the division, looking at all of the inflationary impacts in the divisions, such as contracted uh, services, utilities, all kinds of other things that play into it. Okay. And we use 3.07%. And we also, this year, as noted in uh, the deputy city <coughs> manager's presentation, have also presented an additional 1% on top of that for a total of 4.07%. So the, that increase on all of our users. There, the, I, I just, I was hoping, there will be questions about that later, I'm sure. Um, uh, but I was hoping that I could just get, figure out why Parks was using something 50% higher than the city average. But I'll ask that directly of Parks later. So Thank I, you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, I think we're gonna go on to uh, Children's Services. Questions on children's services. Seeing no questions on, we're on, well, you guys were almost snuck it, almost snuck it through, Councillor. <laughs> children's services. Councillor Perks, can I assume you would like to have some questions? Um, maybe on the theme I was asking earlier, more specifically. We have a children's services plan. Where, where are we here? Back here. Morning. We, we have a long-term plan for um, how many spaces we're building, how many subsidized spaces there are going to be, uh, the, what the fees will be for full fee paying parent. There's a long-term strategy there. Yeah, through you, yeah. Mr. Chair, that's correct. We have a 10-year growth strategy plan. So does the plan you put in front of us for this year meet the steps laid out in that 10-year plan? Yes, the plan, the budget that you have in front of you meets the, um, reflects both the provincial and federal contributions to that plan, as well as the city's 20% um, contribution to growth. So on that, I'm, I'm still not quite certain about it. Um, I thought council had said to match the federal and provincial monies. We got the federal and provincial 20% matching, but here we're not matching it in this year. We're spreading out, catching it up 
over five years. Am I understanding that right? Yes, through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. The 20% uh, contribution from the city is phased over five years. So we get the federal and provincial money and we don't give our full 20% this year. We catch up over five years. That's correct. Okay. okay. Um, now I'm just trying to get to, you don't have a lot of capital this I'm just trying to find the number. I'm, I'm trying to find it in every department, and I'm, I'm afraid that I didn't get to it for you. Uh, in your 10-year capital plan, how are we doing with uh, backlog as a percentage of asset value over the 10-year capital plan? Where are we now? Where will we be at the end of the 10 years? That's right, yeah. Through you, Mr. Chair. So we have state of good repair funding in our budget. On average, uh, about 1.4, 1.2 million a year. Uh, our backlog, we're expected to be able to address the backlog by 2026 through this capital plan. Okay, very good. And in your department, um, what was the gapping number? 2%. This the, year? The gapping was approximately 2%. And what are you forecasting for next year? Our gapping would be forecasted similar. Many of our positions are legislated, so uh, because they're direct service delivery and childcare, so our gapping would be essentially similar next year. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Those were my questions. Thank you. Take it into committee, Councillor Carol Van Leighton. Okay. So, um, of the new money coming in, we're, we're, some of it goes to, to creating new subsidies, but some of it goes to affordability, and that's what that's code for is, is trying to, to uh, give relief to the full fee paying parents? That's correct. So how do we prioritize where that goes? Is it just wherever the highest fee is, that's where we go? In terms of addressing affordability, we did target um, centers who had fees in the highest range for infant, toddler, and preschool, and we worked with those community programs to um, address affordability for those highest fees. And I had the, I had the question out there in the, in the hustings. Um, when we do that, is that, uh, uh, that's conditional on, we also sort of review their operations to make sure that the, that the high fee is based on real expense and therefore we're now going to help you with it? Through the chair, that's correct. For operators who received increased funding, there's accountability mechanisms to ensure that month, that, that funding is being applied to affordability. Okay, and then um, um, I'm wondering, because I'm gonna be asking for, for a, a report on this later in the year. Um, while we've been adding spaces, uh, we haven't changed the conditions of the subsidies for some time, uh, uh, I, I understand. I don't see anything in here. Uh, you know, for instance, the, the income thresholds, you pay this much if your income is under such and such. We, we haven't been uh, updating or changing that in any way. Through the chair, the income thresholds are set provincially and you're correct, they have not changed. However, we have formally requested of the province to revisit those income thresholds to see if a change would be uh, necessary or required. Okay. And if we wanted to, uh, to address hardship, if we wanted to look at when someone does hit a threshold and suddenly has to pay a new rate, if we were, if, if we were to phase it, we would have to absorb that with city funds or convince the province that they ought to be doing the same, uh, am I right? Through the chair, the uh, thresholds and the eligibility fee assessment is, is provincially legislated and mandated, so any changes would have to be as a result of changes in legislation. Well, so we could, we, we straight up, never mind if we funded it ourselves, we couldn't do it unless they agreed to it? That's right. Well, we it's part of our there's a fee subsidy agreement? eligibility assessment that right. sets uh, the client's contribution. So anything over and above that would be outside of the uh, fee subsidy funded by the province. So, for uh, for instance, I, I mean, I had it, in in my personal family, I saw what happens when you have this change. I then found out that there are cases where people go from. 300 a month to full fee simply by changing the threshold but there's there's no phasing of that it's you have two weeks to pay the new fee 
That's correct. It's based on the client's annual assessment, which is based on their annual income. Right. So, so the assessment, and they said, okay, we're we're changing your your childcare uh, uh, fee per month by a thousand dollars. We are not allowed to look at phasing that. If we wanted to backfill that with with city funds, could we? Could we say to those people, uh, the province wants you to do this two weeks from now, we are going to phase that. You have a month and a half to get to that amount. Uh, we, we couldn't do that. We would be jeopardizing something if we did that. We wouldn't be able to do that th- using provincial subsidies. Right. We wouldn't be able to do it using provincial subsidies. But I'm saying if the city wanted to backfill that and, and, and create a phasing program, we could do it if we had the dollars or we can't do it because we're not allowed. We, it would create a net city pressure. We could not do it without additional funding. Unless we wanted to create those funds ourselves. What I'm trying to get at is, are we allowed to with city funds or not? If we had city funds. Once a client is no longer eligible for fee subsidy, they become a full fee client, and then the right. city would have the authority to work with those clients around um, adjusting their income outside of Thank the you. provincial program. Thank you, if we wanted to, but currently we don't have any money. I have one other question. I'm sorry it took me so long to get the answer to that one question, but if I could just ask one more question. Yeah, 20 seconds. Okay, thank you. The third basket within the strategy was uh, to move along. We have affordability, we have subsidy, and also uh, um, getting to a, uh, a living wage for child care workers. Are we making progress there this year? Uh, Through the chair, yes, we are. The third um, piece of the strategy was compensation for the workforce, and we are making progress there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. What is currently the wait list for subsidies? The current wait list for subsidies is around 11,800. And is this trending upward or downward? This is trending downward over the past three years. So what was it last year? Um... I think I think it was about fourteen thousand last year. Eighteen. That was the year before. It's trended down from eighteen thousand down to eleven thousand over twenty-seven and eighteen. Over twenty-seven. Yeah. Um, what was the reason you you said that we're we're choosing to to phase in the the city's portion of the growth strategy funding over five years. Why? Why are we doing it over five, not two? It seemed to me that the city committed to two. So we've been, we have phased in the city's contribution to ensure that as fee subsidies are added, we actually have physical spaces for those subsidies. So we've try, we've looked at the timing of when new capital projects will be delivered over the next three to four years, and then time the subsidies to coincide with those new spaces. So we're holding back subsidies so that there are subsidies when new spaces come online? Um, I wouldn't say we're holding back. We're being responsive to the number of spaces in the current system and ensuring we have enough fee subsidies for those spaces, but also planning um, a future uh, uh, contribution to make sure that we can have subsidies for those spaces. So how many, if we're on year two of, of the phase-in, correct? That's correct. So if we were to phase it in entirely in two years, what, how many subsidies would we have as of this budget? The phased-in approach calls for an additional 760 subsidies over five years. So in addition to the 210 we're adding this year, it would be another over 500, close to 600 subsidies. So instead of adding 600 in your phase in two, we're adding another 200. 210. 210. So the difference is about 540, 550. Mm-hmm. That are subsidies that will be uh, at the end of the five year, our five year phase in. Were there any conditions on the federal and provincial money around how fast the city's 20% needed to be activated? Through the chair, the, uh, there was no conditions on the federal and provincial funding in terms of the city's contribution. But there was one that we had to contribute 20%. It didn't even include that? No, sorry. The uh, federal and provincial money was 100%, was 100%, did not have a cost share requirement. Okay. 
but the city uh, opted to do a cost share. That's correct. 20%. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Councillor Nunziata? Yeah, just, just one question on the budget notes. Um, Twenty-seven of forty-four. That uh, two thousand and thirty-five new childcare spaces are under construction. With so are those uh, new facilities that are being built, um, or are they uh, spaces in schools and? through the chair it's a combination so we have a number of capital projects that are going on about 60 percent of those projects are in uh, schools or facilities uh, catholic and uh, public school boards we also have a number of projects that are in new facilities where we partner with parks forestry and recreation toronto community housing so it's a combination Okay, so the one that's being built on Western Road from uh, that Metrolinx is building, is that included in that amount, the 100 spaces? Uh, yes, that's correct. So that's included in that's that 2035? Yeah. Yes. Okay, and that's that's a city, that's a new facility, city, well, actually Metrolinx is building it, right? That's correct. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Councillor. We'll move on next to court services. Questions on court services? Okay, we'll go on to economic development and culture. I see one hand so far, so we'll start with Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, um, it's it's a little. Oops, I have to get back to it now. It's a little frustrating um, here. Economic development is is divided up into its various services. Right behind you. Oh, <laughs> that's why I couldn't see you. So it's divided up into its various uh, uh, services, uh, you know, business services, arts and culture, uh, et cetera. But when I go to the, the chart about uh, uh, looking at uh, 19 against past years, then it's not broken down into those clusters. Is it possible for you to, to do that for me off the top of your head or should, would I have to order that in the briefing note? What I can, off the top of my head, I can give you general directions in each of those areas if you want. Yeah. Um, I can't give you specific numbers, but I can. Well, not specific numbers, but uh, are each of those divisions are, are being flatlined or some being reduced as a result of Global Toronto? Any, any, any sort of changes from year to year in general? So in general, uh, we have four client-facing sections, we call yeah. them. Yeah. Um, business growth services has been generally flatlined, although there's some um, net zero increases this year. Uh, the other three sections are all cultural, and all, each of them have over the last few years received extra funding as a result of increasing the $2 per capita. Toronto Global has had no impact on our core funding because it was being funded externally to the city through in, when Invest Toronto was around and it stays oh, right. externally balanced oh. since then due to uh, TPLC, TEDCO, Create Teal. Okay. And then museums and art services and museum and heritage services? Have been, they're all cultural and so each of them have received additional funding, albeit small, over the last five years. Right, uh, uh, as part of the art strategy. That's right, and it's a bit difficult to track year to year because we had the Pan Am Games and we had the uh, Canada Sesquicentennial, Centennial and those bumped it, the funding up temporarily during those periods of time as well. Okay. Um, in the, there's some new and enhanced services here that, that f fit sort of all over the place and it appears none are going to be... Uh, um, uh, none will be, be funded because they're new and enhanced. They, the Indian Residential School Survivors uh, uh, structure, it, it looks like zero funds. So that comes from a reserve currently. So it is going to be funded? Yes. And the, the pop-up shops pilot, that, that was going to be, yes, be that's funded from the, and extended? That's from the, VU, the vacant unit rebate uh, cancellation. And that's still, that's still okay? Yes. According to projection, we can afford to keep doing it? Yes. Okay. And then, in general, in, in terms of arts and culture, I didn't have time to delve uh, more deeply into this, so I apologize if it's outlined in the analyst notes and I haven't got to it yet. But 
the while we have different different names for them now, the majors versus the minors versus the lassos themselves, um, is is the strategy for for the lassos on track such that as as they're available uh, as they're as they're able to provide services, we're equitably floating all boats in terms of the the local art service organizations. Well, on our funding this year, we're uh, flatlined. Yeah. So. Therefore, lassos are flatlined this year. So in flatlining them, does that disadvantage the, we have a couple that are new, and admittedly one of them is North York and from where I come, <laughs> but, yeah. but there are a couple that are new. It's North York and, and one of the downtown ones, and then the others that are more established that, you know, some of them have bricks and mortar spaces and such. When we flatline, do we disadvantage the ones that are less mature? Well, the ones that were less mature have received more funding in previous years, so there is some leveling that was done, but the leveling hasn't been completed. Oh, okay, so we did do some, we just have, if we flatline this year, we haven't completed, so that's another thing that we would have to catch up in future years. Correct. Okay, uh, to meet unmet demand. I had one other, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, let me just check. Um, uh, no, I, I, I may just order the breakdown according to the service buckets. I may ask for a briefing note that we do get look at the last two years. Thanks. Okay. Great. Any other questions on uh, Councillor Nunzia? I'm trying to find it in the briefing notes. Um, just the one question. For the BIAs, um, Councillor Carroll, I'm asking a question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for the BIAs, the the uh, the facade program, we're funding that. Sorry, the which programs? Facade. Uh, yes. So that, for the same amount, we haven't reduced Correct. that, right? Yep. Okay, because I don't see it anywhere in here. I just yeah, want to make sure it's it in the de detail, detailed, but it's it's there. It's there. Yep. Okay, and then the streetscape and that. So that all. All that funding is all the same. Uh, for, for the BIAs, right? Yes. Um, have have there been uh, has there been an increase? Uh, uh, last year we, we we discussed, and I don't know if it would be in your budget or or uh, would it be um, um, in the waste uh, budget. Um, that we were going to ask the BIAs um, to pay for the cost of special events. Like, is that in your budget or whose budget is that in? Um, I don't remember that particular ask, but uh, transport if it's transportation Is it under cost, transportation? But m many... Uh, for special events, after right. they have a special event and there's a road closure, we were, there was a fee that we were going to charge them. It, I just want to know where that is. We'd have or if to it's there. We haven't got to look at No? Nobody knows? We haven't been sidled. We haven't been. Uh, okay. No. So we well, have that's not okay. been asked. When you find it, let me know <laughs> where it is. Okay. Cause Thanks. I th no. yeah. uh, Nothing in our budget and we haven't been asked. To no, so it's not your budget. It's somebody no. else's budget. Right. Okay. Questions? Councillor Bradford? Thanks very much. Uh, through the chair, very quickly to uh, EDC. Has the elimination of the city's vacant uh, commercial tax rebate program led to any quantifiable results in reducing storefront vacancies? It's pretty hard to measure that in, in an ideal time and at a time right now with extra tax loads. Um, I, I would be hard, I don't have the data, so the short answer is I don't have the data. Second answer is, I don't think the data will ever be clear because of the, uh, we brought in, or the uh, provincial government brought in the reassessment, and that in fact impacted many retail strips disproportionately. So we do know that there is increased retail vacancies. Um, I don't think it's related at all to the VUR. Uh, I believe it's related to, to um, property valuation changes. However, we are, we have a study in the field now to take a look at Main Street retail and the trends on Main Street retail 
as a result of things like home shopping and tax burdens. So uh, I hope we have a better answer to your question later this year. Uh, do we have, is there anything included in the, and I apologize if it's in the analyst notes, uh, in the budget for this year that would help support uh, local businesses on Main Street? Yes, so there is some short-term uh, program expansions using the VUR rebate funding to expand uh, our, our assistance both in BIAs and in non-BIA areas. Uh, it's about a half a million dollars, I think. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. This is on page 10 of the analyst notes. Um, just going down the, the table too, the reversal of one-time funding, how much of a pressure was that of the 224,000, 100,000? Was it all of it? Was it? And what, what was that one-time? So that, that was tied to the, uh, to the locate services that uh, the cost sharing we do with them with respect to transportation and also one-time travel costs that have stopped. Okay. Um, sorry, so the reversal of the one-time BIA, uh, a one-time locate services are also listed in business services below. Um, I, my first question was about, and this might not have been clear, was the prior year impacts. It says it's reversal of one-time funding and COLA expenditures. Can you explain how and what the $220,000 were? Non-union COLA paid corporately. Okay. And the reversal of one-time funding, same thing? That was one-time funding for that? So we reinstated some travel budget because we used some of that last year to do the locate services. I was I misspoke the first time. I okay, said. okay, that's fine. Um, further down the list, it says other under other based expenditures, the zero based items, consulting fees and studies. Are there some studies that we were supposed to do that we're not doing? Is it a reduction in the budget for consulting fees and studies? I don't understand the answer, but it's still continuing. It's a less, uh, we're spending less this year in that area. Okay. Um, I, I'll probably want to get just some clarity and we yeah, can no, do, that we'll do that offline, offline if that's all right. That's fine. Um, the, the grants to, to, to the majors, are we seeing any change in them? No, they're flatlined. They're flatlined. And how long have they been flatlined for? Uh, we actually took a little bit away from one of them last year uh, to encourage greater focus on diversity, if we can put it that way. Uh, but prior to that, they received uh, significant increases in the first three years of the increased um, cultural funding. And the cultural funding overall, where does it sit? compared to last year? Flatlined. It's been flatlined. So there's no COLA increase intended or, or outlined in the budget? No. Um, there's something about the Zion Church no longer being in the arts portfolio. Can someone explain that? So Zion, the Zion Church is a small hall at uh, next to Seneca on Finch. Uh, we did some programming in it ourselves. We was becoming... Uh, uh, costly and ineffective, so we've now put it up to the B to the below market rent program, looking for a third party to run it on that basis. And the cost has just been the the cost savings has been absorbed. Yeah, I mean it was very small. It was staff doing it off the corner of their desk, quite frankly. Okay. Um, the. Uh, the international alliances, this is our partnerships with other cities. Correct. It's got a budget of 2.3 million 
or no. or thereabouts? No. That, so that so that includes the Toronto Global number, which is nine hundred, almost nine hundred thousand dollars. So it's Toronto Global and these alliance alliances. The alliance programs and our international travel and the staffing in that area and our uh, funding of export support programs, which includes a partnership with the World Trade Center. Does, or can someone give me an idea about how much of that is a travel budget? Uh, by percentage, is it half? Sorry, Councillor? Just by percentage, how much is travel related? About a quarter. A quarter, okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Councillor McKelvey, questions? Thank you. Uh, my question is very broad. I'm just wondering if you could speak to what your process is for review to look at equity to see that your programs are creating um, growth across the entire city and that they're balanced out so we're not just getting growth in one area in particular, but everyone is benefiting by economic growth. Uh, thank you for uh, focusing on that area. Uh, we recently did a divisional resourcing strategic uh, plan, if you can call it that. Inclusion and equity is the number one focus of that. We are currently doing an equity audit, so trying to understand how all our programs currently are spread towards, or not, towards geography and towards equity-seeking groups. Um, we know that some of our programs, such as our majors, are heavily concentrated in the downtown core, and we're focusing more and more of our efforts in distributing and supporting culture outside the core and also supporting job creation outside the core. So uh, we will have definitive numbers as to uh, the degrees of imbalance that we have and our efforts to rebalance, which we continue to do both directly with our own programming and also in the, those areas where we program third parties and encouraging them, for instance, the Toronto Arts Council has put in place several programs to support uh, the growth of arts outside the core. So it's a high priority of our effort. I'm happy to sit down and brief you in detail on that. You mentioned then there'll be a report or some, uh, that there is data that is available on this. When will that be? Uh, we're in the midst of doing it now, so in the next couple of months. Okay, great. I look forward to reading it. Thank Good. you. Thank you. I should point out that the data is not great. So from the point of view, of uh, quality of the data so that one of the main recommendations will be on doing better job of getting the data that tells us how we're doing or not doing. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, now we have about five minutes. I just want to see if there's questions on the Toronto Paramedic Services. So they don't, in the event that there's not, then they don't have to come back after lunch. Okay. What about, and I'm assuming there'll be uh, questions on long-term care and homes and services? Okay, so why don't we, why don't we just leave that till after lunch? Why don't we just take our break now and we'll be back at 1.30. So we'll start off with long-term care and homes and services.